Hello and welcome to our bootleg talk show. We are streaming live from the Brunswick Mechanics Institute as part of Next Wave's Radio Wave program. Welcome to wherever you're tuning in from and however you're tuning in. Um, before we dive in, we want to properly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're broadcasting from today. That's the Wurundjeri and the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nations. So we're eternally grateful for their continuing culture and their contribution that they make to the life of our city and this region. Both Dario and my own presence here is defined by our status as uninvited guests who implicitly benefit from the mechanisms of colonisation or colonialism, sorry. <laughs> Um, so it's from this perspective that we'd like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the unceded lands and waters of this nation state, so-called Australia. So I also want to quickly take a moment to note that this project would not have been possible without the extraordinary voluntarism of countless people. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> so we'd like to say a big thank you to Arts Front in Queensland to Next Wave, to Blindside, and also to the City of Melbourne for their generosity in supporting this experimental, epic, long-form live stream. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty long-form and very experimental, and we have some amazing artists and thinkers with us today in multiple rooms in Australia and in Europe. Um, this virtual symposium is an experimental format. It is an artwork, and we're really wanting to ground ideas of artistic practice in the economy and creative process. The project is called Artist-Led Economy. The term was originally conceived by Rebecca Conroy, an artist who will be joining us later in the program as an agitator with the panellists in the Q&A. So she'll be expanding on some of those ideas then. So what is an artist-led economy? Uh, so we're using the term artist here as a synonym for creative, all of the creative and caring capacities and needs of all living things. So an artist-led economy is an ecology economy. And in Rebecca's words, it's one that is driven by interdependence, relationality and movement. It's an economy that's open source. It facilitates mutual exchange, non-binary thinking, and it's one that really supports humans to realise their creative possibilities whatever they might be. So in that same spirit, the discussion today is going to operate in an interconnected format. It's based on circles of different circles of engagement and around activity that's occurred prior to today and activity that will continue afterwards. Lots of activity. Yeah. So the project is operating across multiple interfaces um, in real time. So look, the technology is complex and we might fail, no, we <laughs> might fa not fail. Actually, things <laughs> might fail, it is an option and that's totally fine. This is an artwork and, and that is the risk that we take as artists and that's why art is so important because it actually allows you to explore reality and explore life and actually make with it. So, you know, we're doing that right now. So, you know, if all of a sudden <laughs> you can't hear my voice, it's fine because something else is gonna happen. There's always something more, and more is more, as we know. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing as part of this is one of our interfaces is that we're going to jump into the magic Zoom box and say hello to all of our agitators and panellists <laughs> who are joining us from Australia and Europe. And we'll come back here and we'll show you some other amazing things that are in this space as well. So I'm Dario. This is Lucy. Um, in this room with us as well, we have some amazing crew and we really need to talk about Matt Gingold and Sarah Jane Woolahan who have made this happen with us since COVID kind of deep mass isolation about a month and a half ago. Somehow we all just pulled this together because, you know, it was necessary. So while we're talking and during the presentations today, there's another group of people who are collaborating online and they're building an artwork that started two days ago. Uh, so we'll be crossing live to this work throughout the next three hours, but for now we're going to cross to Nat Grant in the studio uh, to kick things off with a live performance. So Nat is an artist who uh, we had programmed at Blindside originally, but was affected by the kind of social distancing regulations and the closing of our gallery. So we're really excited to have Nat in the studio with us today um, to perform to all of you.
Wow, that is so beautiful. It's like thunder and rainbows and just really deep and powerful. Thank you. So cool. Yeah. Um, so Nat, as a real live artist here right now with us, yeah. um, could you talk a little bit about um, your relationship to this space and the materiality that you work with and a little bit about what it means to you when you have the space and freed time to engage in your practice? Which is a really pertinent question right now, isn't it? Because we've had a lot of free time, some of us, but um, under even more stress and pressure than, say, we normally um, would. So I may... Who am I talking? Am I talking to you? Or the <laughs> <laughs> um, Talk to uh, I'm a freelance... Um, what do I say I do now? I do things with sound. Someone said that to me once. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's it. I do things with sound. Um, percussion is the basis for a lot of those things. Um, so I play the drums and sometimes drum and um, with sometimes with electronic manipulation, sometimes without, often with other people. Um, and I also make radio and curate shows and lots of other things as we all awesome. do, all the hats. Um, and I think I said to you yesterday when we came into this space, into the Mechanics Institute, how at ease I feel in this space because of the amount of time I've spent here and that is thanks to them and thanks to Next Wave who've supported me over years. Um, I've done residencies here, I've put on shows here, I've always had um, amazing support from them and to have, you know, I'm really lucky I do have a space I can set up my drums outside of my bedroom and play, um, but to have had the support of developing a work here, having access to a theatre and a technician and support to put on a show, um, yeah, it's game changing. Do you want to talk a little bit about how um, different it is to kind of produce artwork under those conditions rather than the conditions of, I guess, the minimal support that a lot of artists might receive or no support? Um, yeah, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, I think, you know, I don't really buy into that tortured artist yeah. myth. Um, and there is a freedom knowing just having some kind of safety, whether that is physical um, space, whether that is having a contribution towards your rent or something mm. like that, that frees up some brain space to actually just get on with it and make yeah. and make stuff. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Nat. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we've got some really great presenters joining us today to talk about the different possibilities of universal basic income. Um, so UBI, Universal Basic Income, it's an idea that's floated around here in Australia for quite some time. Um, and certainly in a global context, it has had several pi pilots and experiments that have occurred and that are still occurring now. Um, and there are many ways that a UBI can be understood. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about that from our presenters shortly. But I guess um, before we jump into those presentations, we just kind of want to frame UBI um, as a, I guess it, at its very core, it's a regular recurring payment that's provided universally, unconditionally, and it's in cash. So it's money that you can spend on whatever you like. This is where you are valued, you know, beyond your ability to find paid work. Um, and where we trust each other to participate and, and circulate and give. Um, mm. it's a, it, it really is a, a different way of looking at humans and how we kind of exchange um, beyond the, the, the current kind of mm, competitive and pretty nasty ways that we economise the globe. Yeah, and that unconditionality of UBI is really important. Mm. A UBI is not means tested. You don't have a mutual obligation to UBI. Um, so for us, our interest in UBI is not really about economics or even about those kind of systems of distribution and exchange that sit within a UBI. What we're interested in is in ecology, valuing life and in cre uh, freedom and creativity. And with this model of thinking, we provoke that all humans are actually artists. <laughs>
Loriana Lucioni uh, is our first presenter. Uh, she is a PhD student at the University of Queensland where she investigates the cultural and political feasibility of universal basic income in Australia. She's also, uh, she also co-coordinates the Universal Basic Income Hub in the New Economy Network. Take it away, Loriana. Loriana Lucioni. Um, the topic of my mm -hmm. speech. So um, yes, I would like to focus this presentation on the, on the role of discourse in society, which is both liberating and enslaving. And I will particularly focus on how a universal basic income implemented at the core of a broader vision of a broader story of society can initiate and accompany a deeper radical and fundamental change in discourse. Therefore, in our culture, uh, in our understanding of the self, in the meaning and modes of social interaction, in our relationship to other species and ultimately to the planet on which we are hosts, as Heidegger said. So this is a story that the very broad defined left has not been able to articulate so far. And uh, we must remind ourselves that even in the glory days, the golden years of the left between the late 1940s and the beginning of the 1970s, uh, well, these years were not so much more than a compromise between profit dri driven and exploitative forces of capitalism and the let's stave off the worst effect of social democracy. So this story, which needs to be cre credible, convincing, comprehensible and comprehensive, um, this, new, this vision of the new possible is long overdue. And regardless of the multiple threats and crises that we've been living through um, and we are living through, regardless of the suffering, which is recorded both in uh, uh, material uh, inequality rates and in uh, um, epidemics and pandemics of mental illnesses, regardless of the widespread um, acknowledgement and acceptance of the limits of the planet resources, we seem unable as a species, so at a global level, to redefine what is possible. And we are, we are stuck in fear, we are stuck in anxiety and in the paralysis that it, all of this produces. And we cannot see hope because the realization of this hope actually requires fundamental changes, which are at the value level and at the meaning level. So what is the role of discourse in this inescapable trap? And what is the role of a universal basic income? So let us start from an overview of what I mean by discourse, or better the discourses that have governed our contemporary era. So a discourse, which is also known as a paradigm in Kuhn philosophy, or an epistem in a Foucault language can be thought of as an organizing principle of society. It's organizing because it confers meanings to everything, to the self, to the society. It establishes roles, defines values, and therefore it directly affects and shapes what we think, what we do, and how we do it. In other words, it pierces through the material reality with real effects in the real world. So for example, the famous, the neoliberal discourse, uh, which has articulated a specific view of human nature. So the self-interested, competitive, selfish, and above all, uh, rational calculative being uh, has a certain number of values attached, which are functional to the very existence of this mythical being. And these are, uh, well, the value of efficiency, of productivity, materialism, uh, individualism, speed, etc. So this very construction of human and of human need is necessary for the system, for the neoliberal now rentier form of capitalism to function. So we have to compete, we have to produce, we have to compare, to strive, to grow as an end in itself, to grow. And this discourse, which was skillfully articulated in a broader frame, in a broader story by the Montpellerin society from the late 1940s has become so hegemonic to be invisible. It's our common sense. On top of that, neoliberalism united in a marriage of mutual advantages and compromises with neoconservativism and got sedimented during the Thatcher, Thatcher and Reagan years. From neoconservativism uh, genome, we have inherited a number of things. So a deeply seated uh, patriarchal structure of our society. We have iner inherited the work ethic, the male white, breadwinner model that has colonized the care ethic of our caretaking species. 
to the point where caregivers, which are still predominantly uh, women, are, are forced to adapt, to strive, and to compete in a very cutthroat model in education in the labor markets. We have inherited concepts such as the deserving and the undeserving poor, the dull bludger, that not only transforms the weakest in our societies into supplicants because they are deprived of voice, it shapes their perception of the self by suppressing their self-worth and their inner human value, therefore their capacity to self-determinate their future. And of course, on the opposite hand, has allowed the wealthiest in our society to persuade themselves and ourselves that they merit all the wealth that they've accumulated. The end story of this marriage is well known and we are in fact living through it. It's a word on, on, the, blink, on the brink of collapse. So what does that have a UBI, universal basic income, do to do with all this? Isn't UBI just some uh, conspiracy from Silicon Valley or some hardcore socialist a dream of authoritarianism or some decrepit communist last hope. Well, I think that there are, these are understandable uh, questions, you know, and there is an understandable fear that underlies these uh, questions, uh, which is given by, by our common past and, few, and present. However, there is also a lack of hope in this question, and it's a lack of hope that worries me. It's a shortage of what Mills called the soci sociological imagination. And it's a form of resignation really <clears throat> to accept that humans might truly be what modern discourses have made us to believe. I would instead argue that a universal basic income understood in its broader sense. So firstly, it's universal, which means that every citizen regardless of age is entitled to it and it's not means tested. Unconditional in the sense of being obligation free. There is no willingness to work test and it's paid on the individual, not household basic basis. It's basic, so we can think of it as a floor on which everyone can stand and build the, uh, their lives in whatever way they want so that there could also be a top up from other incomes. And one that needs to be high enough to offer a real exit option from labor markets and uh, market logic. And also importantly, talking to the broader left, one that does not substitute for the public funding of quality education, healthcare, and additional services that might be required. And ultimately it's an income, so it's paid in cash. It's not any paternalistic measure of provision of goods and services, and it's not based on a charity principle, which underpins the current welfare states. It's based on a right principle. And it's in this rightful share of the commons. It's the uh, uh, rightful share of the knowledge of the social wealth that we have inherited as a species that we find one of the three philosophical uh, bases on which UBI stands. And the other two bases are philosophical bases are libertarian conception of freedom, which is the freedom to choose and the freedom to say no, and the Republican conception of freedom from domination. So this universal basic income can become the core policy of a fundamental discursive shift that will enable the cultural, social, psychological, social, political, and economic shift towards a society built on the values um, that were listed at the beginning. So it's interdependence, equality, universalism, social and ecological justice. So how can we do it? Well, universal basic income needs to be framed with other circulating progressive discourses and articulated with their deeper values. These discourses already exist and a universal basic income articulates their values in the following ways. Firstly, it embodies a refusal to measure social value and personal dignity of human beings based on their participation in the production and in the consumption process, uh, which rings true for the broader post-productivist discourse. Secondly, it reevaluates care, care for each other, care for nature, care for one and for ourselves, and all the activities that are delinked from profit making. In other words, it allows for the mutual recognition of autonomy as human beings, and it fosters trust, which is so much needed in our society. 
It is paid at the individual, not household basis. Therefore, it could address an equal and gender-based power relationship within the household. And this is obviously shared by uh, various strands of feminist discourse. It democratizes the politics of time towards more time-rich and less consumption-oriented lifestyles so that it can undermine the commodification of everyday life and facilitates a sustainable transition within ecological limits as ecologists, environmentalist discourses would demand. Its universal character means that it might strengthen social solidarity and social cohesion because it's universal, everyone is treated equally. It might reignite the value and significance of the common good, which we seem to have lost a while ago, and allow time, resources, and the mental capacity that we need to um, be engaged politically, to be engaged in the decisions of this common good as communitarians and radical democratic uh, discourses advocate for. It embodies the original passion of socialist discourse in that it radically recast the power relationship between labor and capital because it delinks a duty to work from a right to income. And by doing so, it does not deny that paid labor gives some form of dignity. It does not deny that uh, paid labor functionally structures time. What it does is that it broadens what we as a society define and recognize as valuable work and enables the possibility to say no to jobs that have no intrinsic psychological and social value. It removes domination from state bureaucracy, from employers, from husbands, from market logic. It allows for self-determination and for risk taking, which is so much demanded by left libertarians. And it also removes state paternalism, which is demanded by right libertarians. Uh, ultimately, it frees up all the human creative forces to redesign technologies, their use, and the distribution of their benefits, which is very unequal and impacting society in very different ways. So universal basic income, a policy that could be simply be considered an instrument to radical redistribution, could in fact initiate a paradigmatic shift. And if it is all now in the hands of, well, of us, certainly as citizens, but also of the broadly defined progressive left to maturely deliberate addressing their differences, the internal differences, not suppressing them, and to articulate the similar values and political demands in a much needed vision. A corollary of other policies will be needed, absolutely, to guide society in the direction that this uh, vision demands. And in this, a universal basic income can be a first and not a last step. That's all from me, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was amazing, Loriana. Thank you so much, Loriana. That was amazing. It really is a universalizing concept, and it is something which you foregrounded so clearly there that the current discourses that we have been living under for so long are actually really not beneficial to, to, to the species and multiple species that are on this planet. And it is time for something like this to really, to really kick in. So next, we have Greg Marston. Greg is a professor of social policy and is the Deputy Executive Dean of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland. And he's also the co-coordinator of Basic Income Guarantee Australia. So we're going to cross over to Greg now into Zoom. No, we're not going to do that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit more about Greg in the meantime. So prior to entering academia, Greg worked in the not-for-profit sector at a local, state and national level. Um, his research interests include poverty and unemployment, technology and work and social service delivery models. Um, so his most recent books are co-edited collection on basic income in Australia and New Zealand. So that came out in 2016. Work and the welfare state, street level organisations and welfare politics, which was released in 2013 and the Australian Welfare State Who Benefits Now. And that came out in 2013. So we're looking forward to hearing from Greg shortly. Um, but in the meantime, we're just... I think it would be good to maybe just like unpack a little bit about what Loriana was talking about. Because okay, I sure. think that actually what Loriana put forward is a fundamental thing that we really need to be addressing in the progressive left. Like, you know, wh what is actually wrong with the way we currently value 
human labour and human enterprise. And instead of actually looking at how we value, maybe it should be more about, you know, what are the values that we are, we are thinking it by? Sure. And I think too, within the context of this artist-led economy idea that we've been talking about, um, it's especially pertinent because artists do bring value. Artists bring mm. a lot of value. And mm. in this kind of recent time of isolation, um, that is what has fed us. I wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners. Happy to Greg. <laughs> uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and to recognise that those lands were never ceded. Um, I also want to thank Daria and Lucy for the invitation to be part of this. Um, I think it's an exciting opportunity to rethink our economy uh, and society and I guess what constitutes a meaningful life uh, and the good society. I have got some notes. I'm going to try to uh, make sure that that keeps me to time. Um, I'm going to try to... I guess, uh, look at some of the debates within the social, the basic income movement, um, to look at some of the other arguments for basic income, um, and then to think about what this moment means in terms of the pandemic. Um, so lots of this, I think, in terms of thinking about work, as Floriana has said, is, is an attempt to kind of reclaim work. Um, and thinking about the good society and what constitutes decent work, and not just you know, questions from my own research, but they've also driven my own kind of work history as many people have had crap jobs, periods of no jobs, um, dropping in and out of an arts degree, volunteering, parenting, further study. And for the last 15 or so years, I've had a, a good job, um, which you know, I define as a high degree of autonomy, ability to exercise voice and relative financial security. So the idea of UBI, as Laureana has indicated, is an attempt to spread these principles of economic security and freedom to all citizens. And we need to promote these markers of a good society at a time when paid work is becoming a less reliable source of income, of rights, and of belonging. A UBI is an attempt to loosen the tight coupling between income and labor. Um, UBI treats economic risk and economic security really as kind of two sides of the same coin. So if we want people to experiment in a new economy with alternative sources of income, we need to develop a new craft or if they want to develop a new skill, then we need to provide security to allow room for risk. So contrast just the present in terms of what we do with people who find themselves unemployed. For the last 20 years or so, what we do is we cajole people down in one path through a social security system that is really more of a surveillance state than a welfare state. In my research, I've spent the last 10 or 15 years following people we spend their time in pointless training programs, dead-end jobs, work for the dull schemes. Um, worse still, some return to work programs actually prolong unemployment. After all, spending a working week attending pointless workshops, performing mindless tasks, leaves little time for real education, parenting, volunteering, or looking for a real job. So our whole approach in the so-called welfare to work programs in this country and others is really to add cultural insult to economic injury, to borrow a phrase from Nancy Fraser. This isn't a war on poverty, it's a war on the poor. And so it's for all these reasons that the UN UBI stands for both unconditional and universal. In fact, some UBI advocates would privilege the unconditional over the universal. They would tolerate targeting of assistance if it would mean we could have a basic income sooner rather than later. And I certainly respect this point of view because it's pragmatic. It promotes a stepping stone approach. For example, we could, as a society, decide to give a basic income first to young people who we know face difficult transitions after leaving school. We also know that young people in the context of this pandemic are reporting high levels of anxiety due to financial insecurity. We could also target a basic income to older people who typically face high rates of discrimination in the labour market. Or alternatively, we could take a place-based approach and target basic income towards communities, particularly those affected by bushfires and other crises who are struggling to bounce back. Communities that are having great difficulty at the moment getting government assistance. The basic point is that income in these communities is always well spent because it gets spent on essential goods and services to get these local economies going again. But having said that, a stepping stone approach is not without its ethical dilemmas. Who should be in and who should be out and how long should some groups wait? So these are the kind of issues that would prevent some of the sorts of cross-sectoral alliances that Mariana spoke about. So nonetheless, I think we need to acknowledge that 
this is an important debate and that some people would rather emphasize the unconditional rather than the universal. Sometimes I think these positions are held though because of people have an outdated uh, attachment to the paid work ethic and the social contract. My own view is that we need a new social contract for the 21st century and be a bit more imaginative about the sorts of activities that make the world go round and make the place worth living in. As Laureana said, have the care ethic, care for the environment, the arts, leisure, and yes, even idleness. History reminds us that a paid work fetish is a relatively recent phenomenon, really a product of the industrial revolution. Pre-industrial societies never worshiped work. They worshiped multiple gods, such as gods of wisdom, the sky or the sea. And as long as we continue to be obsessed with work, work and more work, the number of superfluous jobs or what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs will only continue to grow. Luckily, there is another way. As Rutger Bregman declares, in a world that's getting richer, where robots produce more stuff at cheaper cost, there's more room for friends, family, community, science, arts, politics, and all the other stuff that makes life worthwhile. But to enjoy these pursuits, we need more tertiary time, or what the philosopher Bob Gooden calls temporal autonomy. So to say we want to liberate time for other pursuits in life does not mean that UBI advocates are anti-work. As Laureano has pointed out, the UBI seeks to reclaim all forms of work, to include the creation of things that have intrinsic value, not just things that have exchange value. And the clue is in the name. It's a basic income, not a maximum income. So some might also say it's better to fight for a permanent increase in new start or job seeker allowance. These are long campaigns. And fighting for welfare rights and labour rights can certainly coexist around a campaign for a UBI. The fight for social justice has different time horizons. We need to be bifocal in our outlook. Yes, we need to seek an immediate increase to new start, as well as set the path towards unconditional economic security for everyone as a rightful share of our commonwealth. Another criticism is that the UBI is anti-welfare state. Universal income and universal health and education are complementary aspects of a modern social democracy. Each sector doing their own bit to decommodify de work, healthcare and education. To be sure, there are libertarians that would favour cashing out their wealth of state, giving people a guaranteed minimum income to drive a user-pay social services system. But egalitarians reject this model. Now, I just want to briefly turn to ecological justifications for UBI, because I think there's potential synergy here between social, environmental and economic goals. But again, steering this course will require significant changes in how we think about work, welfare and our tax models. Because basically, it's counterproductive to force people to work in jobs that simply fuel unsustainable consumption. So I think there are three main ways that a basic income could contribute to helping address climate change. First, an adequate universal basic income would reduce income inequality, which has a positive flow and effect for the environment. Reducing income inequality promotes pro-environment social values and attitudes which makes inherent sense when you think about it, as people with basic levels of economic security have the mental bandwidth to think, think about more than just their survival. Second, the combination of shorter working hours and the universal basic income can reduce our carbon footprint. It is estimated that a worldwide shift to a shorter working week over the course of this century would almost half the carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere, depending on the baseline scenario for each country. The combination of redistributing working hours and introducing UBI will allow people to set their own optimal paid work, leaving time for the other things. Third, the universal basic income could potentially change how we move in and out of cities, given that transport and housing account for about 60% of carbon emissions. So we might see less reliance on the data commute from the urban fringe to the city, and we might see resurgence in localism, some of which we started to see uh, in a very early stages during the lockdown. So some of these kind of discourses, as Laureana said, we could cultivate uh, and allow them to flourish. Which in my final comments now, I just want to turn therefore to the crisis and all of its kind of dystopian, utopian possibilities. As artists, you already have a good sense of the disjuncture between the world we desire and the world that is. You have creativity and ethic of care, freedom of expression, hope, imagination, and on the other hand, a real experience of bureaucratic overreach, control, economic insecurity, devalued social identities in the broader polity. All of these thoughts and emotions come to the surface in the face of crisis. 
but we also look for lessons in, as we search for what a pandemic can teach us. As Walid Ali recently said, pandemics don't change us, they reveal us. They expose how we've organized private and public responsibility for health, housing, income and labor. That are significant disparities between those with low paying conditions and those with relative financial security. Pandemics also reveal the cultural judgments reflected in excluding artists, university workers, and migrant workers from JobKeeper payments. This injustice is immediate, it's real, and it's unfolding before our eyes. But the future isn't fixed. We live in a time of flux or friction that could lead to unpredictable and uncertain outcomes. We get a glimpse into what might be a possible future rather than the all-too predictable future. Like others, I've read a lot about the pandemic, but some of the best work is coming from novelists and who ask the basic question, what were we doing before the crisis? Was it necessary? Was it desirable? One of my favorite pieces on the pandemic was written by Aaron Dudley Roy, who describes the pandemic as a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. Roy writes, our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists, and in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. So let's refuse normality because normal wasn't healthy. To go in a new direction will require courageous leadership and for all of us to be aspirational. We need to start by asking what it would mean to craft a worthwhile ethic rather than slavishly follow a paid work ethic. To quote Harvey Dean, we need to be life first, not work for first, and how we think about social policy in the economy. So we need to reframe, and reframing isn't easy. Um, we're going to need all uh, hands on deck, and we're certainly going to need the arts, because we learn empathy and capacity for imagination through reading fiction. And as Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge, because it's imagination that fuels a desire for a better life and a better future. So we certainly need new research and new knowledge to reframe, but we also need us to help us reset the parameters for the good life and the good society. And certainly one of the exciting developments in the UBI movement is working with artists, poets, photographers, and cinematographers. We had planned an exhibition in September this year based on work of a Canadian photographer called Jesse Gollum. The um, exhibition was gonna be entitled Humans of UBI, which builds on the internationally renowned Humans of New York. Jessie was part of the Ontario basic income experiment. She started taking photographs, collecting stories of people that were in a better place after moving on to the basic income pilot. Unfortunately, the project and the exhibition is delayed, but it illustrates the sorts of collaborations that are possible between artists, activists, and researchers. So to finish, UBI may not be the right answer. It is certainly not a silver bullet. What a UBI does is force us to ask questions about redistribution, recognition, about ways to address economic insecurity and precarity, about how we might value a diversity of social and cultural contributions to the good life. And with the right questions, imagination and local experimentation, we can create what the late Eric Olin Wright called a real utopia today. So let's seize the moment and do it. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that that last bit at the end when you kind of talked about the kind of gateway between one world and the other or one world and the next really resonated with me. I definitely am feeling that at the moment. Um, I think that we're kind of still, kind of stuck, still stuck, kind of not there, but not into in this, next, this world next world yet. Um, yeah, did you want to say anything about that? Oh, no, no, we'll talk again with Greg uh, during the Q&A. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I think, you know, it is a gateway. In a way, yes, I do. Um, I guess it's kind of maybe a good opportunity to talk about, you know, why do we want to do this? You know, what is the gateway for us? Mm. What opportunities are we looking for? And I think that for, my, for me, it's really about wanting to be in a position where I can be my best self. You know, like this symposium that we've put together has really only come about because we've luckily had the opportunity in Australia to have some form of livable wage for the last couple of months during COVID. And that makes a huge difference. Yeah. And um, it, it means that, you know, we can go, hey, let's curate this great show. And not only do that, but let's bring a whole bunch of awesome people together to make it happen. 
and work out the crazy technicalities to do with it, which I've just heard, you know, <laughs> we've kind of effed up a little bit with the chat that you're viewing on YouTube. <laughs> but um, maybe just don't look at that while we're watching the presenters. <laughs> That's um, our canned laughter machine in the background. I think too, you know, there's this thing that we spoke about at the beginning was this idea of failure and potentially we wouldn't really experiment with something like this without kind of that space and that support. I suppose mm. that the, I, the UBI that we might be on right now, it's not a UBI. It's not but, really actually. Um, is kind of allowing us to do this really experimental kind of difficult thing in a really short frame of time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I suppose that is a really good segue into talking about the artwork that we mentioned at the beginning that's been developed. Well, it was it started two days ago. Um, it's an artwork by Citizen Coombs. Uh, it's called A Performance for a World Without Creativity. So basically what this is, is it's a list and it's been developed in collaboration with a number of different people. We had another Zoom conversation mm. um, with a bunch of people, some that we knew and some that we didn't know. Yep. Very active conversation, went for about two and a half hours and yep. you know, it's, it was a really, it started off really kind and then and nice and people were like, actually, this is what I believe, you know. And yeah. It's a debate. This is what we're doing. This is a, space, a democratic space, so. Yeah, and I suppose this list, I think that you might be able to see it now, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, but it's a list of things that wouldn't really exist if it wasn't for creativity and a lot of these rose colored glasses <laughs> contemporary <laughs> dance Bauhaus. um so these instagram so these things i guess are what's been sustaining a lot of us during this period of isolation as yeah. well um, and so that's a really interesting kind of thing that has come about it's not just about artists constantly trying to prove their value and say mm. oh you know you'd notice if we weren't there um and it's something that's sustaining us and it's also something that we're all producing. Yeah. And that's the other aspect to this, you know, like as we we're saying before, you know, in thinking through this model, it, it, we're actually really thinking that all humans are artists. And, and what that really means is like about, this is about creativity, you know, and YouTubers, right? That just came up on the screen. Eurovision, <laughs> nursery rhymes, flamenco dancing. Like we don't necessarily all have the same idea of what art is versus what culture is versus what creativity is. And should we? <laughs> I don't know. Should we value them differently? They intrinsically are valued differently according to our relationship to them. And I guess that's the point to go back to the notion of Rebecca Conroy's ideas around artist-led economy. It is about a relationality and it's about a flow and about exchange. And I think that's what this project speaks to very clearly with Citizen Coombs and We'll come back to them later because they're actually building a project right now with a group called The Advocates, which extends on the list and also kind of uh, asks the ad agitators who are going to be asking questions to the presenters later to really think about things in a slightly different way maybe. So that's cool too. This is happening right now and you know it will keep evolving. I can already see things that I didn't see earlier on the list, so that's really exciting. Yeah, like the <laughs> Adobe Suite mm. or Sound Art. <laughs> Thanks, Citizen Coombs. Great, so we'll be talking to Citizen Coombs a little bit later in a bit more depth about kind of other collaborative works that they've done, the ways that they collaborate together, as well as maybe the list more specifically. Um, but now we're going to cross to Nick McGuigan and Thomas Kern. So Nick and Thomas are co-instigators of something called the Accountability Institute. Um, so the Accountability Institute is interesting because it kind of does what we're trying to do here in that it kind of, um, what does it do? It brings together <laughs> economists, technology, technology, science and artists yeah. to um, look at new ways of doing economy. Yeah. Or accountants, sorry, not ec economists. <laughs> um, and um, Nick and Thomas are, you know, they're, they're amazing communicators and, um, you know, they uh, they lecture and work at Monash and they run a, a they queer accounting. It's one of their kind of, you know, famous things that they're kind of on about. And why is that important? You know, like where the queer theory kind of aspect of, you know, what we're kind of talking about, we talked a bit before about 
um, you know, uh, experimentation and creativity. And for me, that is, you know, a another way of actually understanding that is through querying, you know? Totally, and having a, we talked about it in the beginning, um, to use Conroy's words again, it's a non-binary kind of approach to the economy. Yeah, it's not fixed, right? So, you know, like these things can change. Now, in capital, things can change too, but often those things that are changing, we're just having to consume them because those changes are happening at another level that we don't have access to. And the kind of, you know, the the profits, the, the, the good things that are coming from that kind of labour and that change is, is, is flowing up to uh, people who are accumulating it. And um, it's... Uh, yeah, obviously that's something which doesn't really benefit the world. It doesn't benefit all of us. No, definitely not. Um, so we're having to continue to talk a little bit longer because <laughs> I think we're having technical uh, throw it to it. situation. Oh, no, um, we're going to throw to it. <laughs> we're ready for Thomas and Nick. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Uh, we, we too would like to um, acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on the lands uh, in which we are uh, gathered here today. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders uh, past, present and emerging. So hey everyone, I'm Nick. And I'm Thomas. <laughs> and we're part of the Accountability Institute, which is really looking at trying to bring art, science, economics and technology together and, and kind of have conversations around accounting and accountability. So we're, we're kind of both accountants. Uh, we apologize. Sorry for that. <laughs> but uh, we've been asked to come in and do a little bit of how we account or, or the accounts, how we're gonna cost out this UBI system. So we're just gonna throw to our uh, presentation slides. Great. Okay. So, we have heard so many great reasons for um, UBI and um, actually Loriana and Craig did such an amazing job. Um, I don't want to repeat at all I, and they could do that um, in a much better way than we could do that as accountants. We love to talk in numbers, which we'll get to in a minute, sorry for that. <laughs> But um, so that's what we love. But anyway, so here um, you can see on that slide, again, um, very good reasons for a UBI. Yeah, for example, the first one here, automation, the end of work. That's a very important one. So even if you don't um, grab the concept um, or grasp the concept of UBI, we are, from an economic point of view, humankind and our societies are forced to change something about how wealth is distributed. So we necessarily need to get away from attaching it to employed work. Yeah? So um, that's the consequence, the necessary consequence from automation. Yeah? And I don't want to go into all of those great reasons. Maybe you would like to, in the Q&A part, um, to ask questions about some of those. And I know some of those are probably um, uh, yeah, a bit critical or not um, to your liking necessarily. So if I think about, for example, economic growth, that of course contradicts what we need to do where we hit, um, where we need to hit to in terms of um, environmental uh, sustainability. Yeah. So many people say UBI is good for economic growth because it redistributes income to those who would spend it, and that would be increased consumption. Of course, that has environmental consequences. Yeah? So what might, what has a good side can also have a negative side of all of this. Yeah? So um, I'd like to go into the question, so why is it when we have such good reasons as we have already heard for UBI, why don't we have one already? Yeah? And 
it's binary. Like all good accounting equations, <laughs> it's binary. So we, will, we want to ask two questions. Firstly, can we afford it? And secondly, are we there yet? Yeah. So the first one comes from the, um, um, the biggest uh, argument against UBI. You can hear from governments usually, and also from business circles and more the right-leaning people, if you like, the market people who believe in markets. Um, and they say, we can't afford it. And then the second reason might be, might actually lay within, within us, ourselves, are you, am I ready for it? And that will be the second part, what we would like to uh, talk about. So can we afford it? And that depends on if we want to um, think about that question. That depends, of course, on the model or the scale of the UBI um, you are thinking of. And we um, have um, different models at hand, which were discussed since these decades, actually. So it could come through an, what is called a negative income tax which tops up actually income to a certain threshold, which could be, for example, the poverty line or could be any other threshold above the um, poverty line. And it is integrated into the tax system, obviously. So either if you earn more than a certain threshold, you would pay tax um, to the government, or if you are below a certain threshold, that would be topped up, your income would be topped up to a certain threshold. The second one, and that is actually um, probably what we in a more narrow sense understand under UBI is the demo grant. So it's a grant, an unconditional grant, and Loriana and Craig also talked about this already, um, unconditional and um, somewhat universal, although there are slight differences between the two, as we have learned from Greg. So a grant based on purely demographics. Yeah? And, but in our case, when we talk in a narrow sense about universal income, we would actually grant any member of society um, that grant and that uh, universal basic income. So that would be an amount that is provided to every citizen within a society. The uh, third model that touches on basic income is a so-called universal dividend. And it pays a dividend or a rent out of common wealth, such as land, natural resources, to every citizen. So it's the participation in the common wealth or the common property of a society or a nation. And we also have some examples um, globally. So for example, in Norway or in Alaska, where citizens are or, or take part um, in the rent of common goods and especially um, land or natural resources. Unfortunately, in the, in the case of Alaska, it's oil actually where, where the rent is based on, which um, involves a whole lot of other um, difficulties and things to discuss, but we don't go there at the moment. So just to give you an idea what models, what practical solutions um, are there actually around UBI? Yeah. So, and then it comes um, to the actual affordability. So can the government, and if we actually base our discuss, discussion on the assumption that it is public money that we are using for it, and maybe um, our discussion tonight um, will also lead into areas where it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, public money, but it can also be uh, private money. We might um, discuss this a bit later. But if we um, work on this assumption that the government provides 
uh, this UBI in whatever form. And when um, we then talk about aff affordability, we need to talk about how is it financed from the government. Yeah? And so there is um, many forms to finance such a UBI. For example, one part that could contribute to the financing, financing is the savings from other welfare payments and their associated bureaucracy. And that's also um, an argument that is um, brought into the discussion very often from people supporting UBI, that we actually save a lot of bureaucracy, which is attached to the current welfare system. Yeah? And then the other major part would be through um, taxation, which could then take um, many forms. So for example, we could increase the income or corporate tax rate to finance it. Of course, we could close uh, tax loopholes. We could remove subsidies and tax exemptions. Um, probably all of us remember um, the discussion uh, just before uh, the last election here in, in Australia about a negative hearing and the um, capital gain rebate, which Labour wanted to abolish. And so that would bring in, of course, more income for the government that could then be spent, for example, on UBI. We could increase uh, GST, and there's many models around um, in the world and discuss where we would actually finance it at least partly through the taxation of consumption, which uh, GST, of course, is. Yeah? We could introduce a carbon tax, for example, and actually address two problems at the same time. We could bring down carbon emissions, which we need to do. We need to address climate change um, necessarily. And we could use that carbon tax actually to also fight income in, uh, equality and to get to all the advantages we, we have discussed before. Or the last um, uh, item here on that list, which of, is of course not exhaustive, I just wanted to give you a glimpse about what is possible, what um, can we uh, discuss. The last thing is economic rents on land and natural resources, and that relates um, directly to the universal dividend model I showed you uh, just a slide before. And some people say um, that would be a tax and therefore it's here under tax, but other people say that's actually not a form of taxation and would put it as a separate item. But again, I don't want to spend too much time on such details. So um, to finish up my part, and then Nick will be taking over the more sophisticated, more philosophical parts. <laughs> because I'm more the number guy. I just wanted to um, introduce you to two modeling examples, um, which we found and which were done for the Australian context. So uh, I apologize to any international audience, but that's just um, examples for Australia, how we could go about financing those things. And uh, for example, Ben Phillips from the ANU, for example, did a modeling um, for a scheme that um, would um, give Australians, every Australian citizen, citizens benefits equal to the age pension. So that would be around uh, $23,000 per annum for singles or $34,800 for couples. I'm not sure if it, that might have changed in the meantime. So that was back in 2018. That might have increased slightly. But anyway, so that would be um, roughly so also that you have an idea what would be the benefit for every individual citizen. So that would mean, which is quite interesting, also to give you an idea in terms of numbers, welfare payments would rise from currently 123 billion 
to 378 billion if we would do that. So plus um, over 250 billion more. And if it was financed by income tax, so by an increase of the rates, which was the assumption of uh, Ben Phillips, that would mean we had to increase the rates um, by 33 percentage points. So we would have marginal um, tax rates starting from 33% up to 78%. And that might um, sound shocking for some because we are not used to those rates anymore after all the neoliberal years we have gone through. But actually such tax rates were common before. So it's not something that is um, totally out of place. We had such rates in the US, interestingly. We had such rates in Sweden, for example. And those economies we know worked very well under those um, tax rates. So it is feasible, yeah? And um, just one other modeling to wrap up. If I can move the slides, yeah, no, I can. So, um, that was a little of a study of Gary Floman Hoff, which is with uh, the University of Queensland. So, and he calculated a rent from land, natural resources, and other commonwealth like licenses, um, uh, government monopolies, for example, like uh, gambling and stuff, which of course um, <laughs> includes critical stuff as well again, and we need to talk about the details certainly. But anyway, he added also a carbon tax and minus any um, existing government revenues from these sources. So he was calculating the additional government income through such the rent on land, natural resources, and those other commonwealths. Yeah? And he came up, and it was 2017, with an amount of 200. 89 billion of additional government income, which could be used, for example, if we divide it by the 24 million or so citizens in Australia, they would get $12,000 per year as a UBI. So that is, that is even more the amount, more than was needed for uh, the age pension model I um, showed you just a slide before. So again, it, this is not unrealistic and we have become used to such numbers, especially in recent weeks when we just um, throw out the government billions of dollars like 130 billion first for uh, the JobKeeper model, which then turned out to be only 70 billion. But anyway, as you can see, there is room for um, playing and for experimenting actually with the UBI. But I leave you with that, enough numbers, and I pass on to my better half. Thanks so much, Thomas. Um, so the second part of the kind of what we were trying to unbreak or break down was the asking the question, are we there yet? And I kind of, I really like this image because for us, it represents essentially our relationship with money. Um, we, how we would do anything for money, how we work and we identify um, both by, by earning money and also the work in which we do to get that money. And it's kind of really embedded into the way we think about ourselves and the way we interact and the way we live. We put our trust in that kind of dollar value, if you like, rather than necessarily the trust in each other or in, or in human interaction. And so that's kind of gone really deep into the way we're thinking about ourselves as individuals. Um, there's no such thing as a free lunch, for example. Um, in, in business schools, we often talk about competition and that being competitive in business is really good because we've got to be able to win that dollar and, and obviously generate a profit. And so I'm kind of curious about unpacking that because we need to think about a way in which we can unlearn some of uh, quite a lot of those inherent things that we educate inside business schools, absolutely. Um, so we need a way to build up some of our rethinking around those current societal values and, and how that might happen in recent times. 
And of course, in recent times, we've seen that happen. So we've seen that happen recently in Australia when we were able to achieve marriage equality. And what would be the mar marriage equality movement, if you like, for UBI, for example? And of course, that wasn't easy one. That took a lot of resources and it took a lot of strategic um, integration of a number of different key players inside um, organizations, but also external to organizations as well. And so I kind of think about what is the role that art plays in disrupting some of our values uh, through time. So if we think about social change, social change always occurs when all of these things interact and integrate, uh, et cetera. And I'm kind of, when I think about art, I, I kind of think uh, initially to, to Ryan Presley's work. Ryan Presley, an indigenous artist, um, his recent work called Blood Money is just fascinating. He uses the symbol um, or the infinity symbol, which I found really interesting when you put the infinity symbol on a dollar value. Because in, in this way, we, he's talking about the kind of recurring iterative circulation of, of money and the value that money has is circulating through a community all the time in infinite ways. Just going around and around and around a community with, with an infinite value. And so I'm really interested and we're really interested about how art can play a role in disrupting some of what you're seeing on the screen at the moment. The idea that this kind of ways of thinking, this uh, fluid way of thinking outside the binary needs to happen inside the education, within government agencies, within professional accounting bodies, for example, within our business schools and the way we educate. Our education needs to be much less binary. It needs to be much more, uh, much less about debits and credits, for example, and look at the fluid nature of accounting and accountability and kind of design an accounting system around an ecological systems design, for example. Uh, so really interested about the role that art plays in that context. And it's not just, and sorry, I also wanted to say, we've got so few artists working inside some of these mainstream organizations it would be amazing to think about what art could be doing inside those spaces. And that's why we created the world's first artist in residence program here at the, account, um, at the business school, specifically in accounting, where we create a space for artists to come and join us uh, as an accounting department to rethink some of the ways we, we practice uh, our accountants and the way we educate as well. Um, but if we think about social change, a lot of the first two we're seeing uh, is happening at a much higher kind of strategic global level, if you like. The idea of starting to translate some of these ideas in any medium we can uh, to engage with artists to be able to translate those ideas into different mediums would be really helpful from, from our side in business schools to try and disrupt and actually kind of um, integrate some of those resources into the way we're educating. It'll change the mindset of often those gatekeepers to that environment and also how we can infiltrate that mainstream. So those two things really strategic happen at a kind of global systems focused level. But then I kind of wanted to end our presentation by talking about a local level, because why can't we start a UBI right now? Why can't we engage in UBI principles and actually start it happening right now? So when we engage with our community gardens and we go down to the community garden, we're all about the kind of resources that we have and the individuals that have those land resources to be able to grow food. But if we've got too much food, if we've grown too much, then this is an idea of surplus that we can't use. We're naturally there to gift that food to other people, those resources within that small localized community. So if you think about the, the way a community garden works, why couldn't we start to create a community wage commoning, if you like, and start to think about where geographically we might create those boundaries? Maybe it's sharing our community, our, our wages across the, the, the um one of our roads, for example, with the houses on it, we, we start to collectively pull our waging and then we start to common and, and create that idea of universal basic income right from now. Why can't we start at this point in time? And so we're going to leave it there and then we can pick up on any Q&As later. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing. That was a really good Thank overview you very much. of, um, you know, the situation from an accountability perspective. Um, I think that you know that really speaks to the, the way you kind of left us there in, rega in regards to how can we do this now, you know, on a micro level. How can we actually start looking at the commons and our approach to, you know, relationality on an everyday life is really really important. And I just wanted to bring up something else um, actually that 
uh, one of our uh, agitators actually put forward in the chat just now, Vivian Gerrand, that UBI is actually not new to uh, potential policy in Australia. It was actually very seriously being considered uh, by the Whitlam government in the 70s um, as a way to reduce um, and remove poverty from the country. Um, and it was really just, you know, it, it went with the dismissal. Um, mm. So uh, Vivian will we'll ask more questions and kind of talk to that a bit more later. Um, but I think that that's important when we're thinking about feasibility, which I really feel like Nick and Thomas nailed. It totally sounds feasible and viable. Yeah, well, I guess um, what they really highlighted was that there's so many different options. There's so many different ways that we could kind of implement one. It's not one UBI for all, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and, and it's something which I guess you know needs to adapt to local situation, and you know over time, if that's how we think we want to be living as people, then you know we scale it up, and then we start looking at how it works across nations and how it works yeah. across the globe, etc. So, but it, it it has a different face according to its location. Um, uh, so, thank you very much, Nick and Thomas. Um, we're now going to introduce Charmaine Crow. Uh, Charmaine is a senior advisor at the Australia Council of Social Service, otherwise known as ACOS. It's, uh, uh, she leads the organisation's work across social security policy. Charmaine is directing the campaign uh, currently to increase unemployment and student payments at ACOS, the Raise the Rate campaign. Uh, welcome, Charmaine. Thank you so much. Uh, Dario and Misty, um, and thank you so much for the invitation to present this afternoon. It's, it's really a fantastic opportunity um, and it's been a fantastic discussion so far. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. Um, I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Look, I am going to talk um, about ACOS's position on the future of our income support system in Australia um, in this time of, of crisis. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the opportunities that I see uh, before us. Uh, and um, I'll also touch a little bit on conditionality in our system and some options for reform. Now, um, perhaps somewhat controversially uh, for this discussion, uh, ACOS doesn't actually have a position on universal basic income, uh, but we do have a very clear position that uh, Australia needs to have an income floor under which no one falls, regardless of your circumstances. Uh, we're calling for that income floor to be one that prevents poverty. So regardless of whether you were a student, say, renting privately in a share house, or you were a single parent raising two kids, uh, your income should be above the poverty line. Um, I think uh, the reason why we've not delved too deeply into um, developing policy on a universal basic income is because our focus has been and continues to be uh, lifting up the incomes of people with the least. Uh, many people participating in today's event and watching today's event would know that uh, before COVID, uh, the rate of unemployment payment was about $40 a day, well below the poverty line. Students had an income of even less, of $33 a day. And there is a wealth of research to show that no one can survive on such little money and people were going to great lengths like uh, not showering uh, regularly to save on electricity and water bills, um, regularly going without meals. 90% of people that we surveyed said that they would regularly skip meals. So in a wealthy country like Australia, clearly that is an absolutely un unacceptable situation. Um, it is unfortunate that it took a pandemic uh, to see the government to act and increase these income support payments. Uh, but I must say what has happened or what has resulted is the largest increase that we have seen in the history of our income support system. And it's also the first time that unemployment and student payments have seen a real increase, so above inflation in 26 years. 
I should note the last time they were increased, they were lifted by $2.95 a week. So that gives you a, <laughs> an understanding of how people who are without paid work have been treated in this country. Um, we every day are receiving um, emails and phone calls from people who have had their payments increased. And I just wanna go through some of those because I think they really demonstrate what this actually means for people. Um, I heard from Amanda in Melbourne who has two teenage boys. She was able to replace her broken fridge. And one of the first things she did was go out and buy a trolley full of groceries to fill that fridge. She couldn't remember the last time she was able to do that. Um, I heard from, uh, uh, Michelle in Perth, who was able to enrol herself in an allied health course. Uh, she's 56 and she wanted to pursue uh, a career that she's passionate about. Uh, she's concerned if the government takes away the doubling of the income support payments that have passed um, because she may not be able to complete that course. We have heard from several women who have been able to escape violent relationships as a result of the higher rates of payment. Um, so this demonstrates um, how critical it is to ensure that people's incomes are at least above the poverty line because when they're not, they trap people in horrible situations that no one should be subjected to. Um, I just wanna to touch a little bit on some of the research I'd like to see because I know there's Plenty of researchers involved in this afternoon's talk, so here's my plug. Um, <laughs> um, there's obviously plenty of research out there showing there are higher rates of poorer health outcomes, poorer education outcomes among people with low incomes. Um, that's really clear. What we don't have so much of is research that shows the causal link uh, between a low income and experiencing poor health, health and education outcomes on the other side. Um, and I say this, I think this is important because so often we hear from people who have said, my mental health has declined dramatically since I became unemployed. And it's not because, it's not only because they don't have a job and, and want a job, but it's because the low level of income support payments drives them into a, 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 a situation where they are always anxious, always stressed, and um, to the point where they can't focus on anything else but trying to get their next meal. Um, two academics from the London School of Economics and um, Political Science in the UK, uh, Keris Cooper and Kitty Stewart, who sound like characters out of a Wes Anderson film, but um, they did some excellent research on, um, uh, basically did a systematic analysis of the research that is out there, and there's not much, but they, found that for kids growing up in lower income families, income definitely matters. They were able to show that there's a direct link between low income and poorer education and cognitive development outcomes for kids. So when incomes of the families rose, um, so did uh, the, the education outcomes and the cognitive development outcomes and to a lesser degree, health and behavioral outcomes. So my point is, is that income matters. And I think if we had a firmer or more solid evidence base to show that, some of our decision makers may be uh, better persuaded um, to ensure that people aren't living below the poverty line. Now that brings me to uh, the advocacy question. Um, now, if I'm totally honest, I just can't see the current government uh, saying tomorrow that we should have a universal basic income in Australia. Um, but I am an optimist uh, and I do think that we are in uh, an excellent position uh, to improve on the government's response to the coronavirus and ensure that we have a fairer system on the other side of this pandemic. Um, we know that there are several members of the, the current government who do not think that the old system was working for people. Trent Zimmerman recently came out and said he was going to have discussions with the leadership about not returning to the old rates of payment of $40 a day. It's a really positive thing. Um, the other thing to mention is that uh, it's expected that by September, when these payments are due to be cut, 
there'll be about 1.7 million people who are receiving them. Now, if they were halved, there would be a huge backlash. And not only would it be a tragedy for almost 2 million people in our community to throw them back into a life of poverty, um, but we'd probably also see, uh, if not a, a, a double dip recession, um, the economy certainly going backwards at a time when uh, we are already in a bad position. Um, and I think this is why many business peaks, economists and other conservative commentators are urging the government to not go down that road. Um, uh, so, um, the other thing to add is that the evidence is very clear that people on receiving those payments are actually um, the heroes in our economy right now. They are keeping spending at the level that it is because they're buying the basics, uh, largely because they haven't been able to do that before. Finally, I want to touch on conditionality. Um, now, something that this crisis has very clearly demonstrated was that uh, Australia had gone way too far uh, in terms of uh, the conditions tied to payments. Um, one of the first things that the government did, even before the mass job losses took effect, was to remove a bunch of conditions tied to payments from waiting periods through to, you know, not allowing any new um, uh, um, people that have come into the system go onto the cashless debit card. Um, I think it's very clear that particularly in the last 15 years, um, mutual obligation has gone too far. Of course, the government suspended mutual obligation requirements during this pandemic. And the question is why? Um, yes, okay, there are not um, the, the jobs that are available that there were beforehand. Um, but I think there's also was a, a very clear sense that we cannot expect to subject so many people to this very punitive um, system that well and truly punishes you for being on a low income. Uh, and I do hope that COVID-19 uh, sounds the death knell for Work for the Doll, which is probably one of the biggest failures in public policy that we have seen in recent times. Um, it improves people's chances of getting a, pay, a, a, a job by 2%. Um, so I am hopeful that on the other side of this pandemic, we move away from a system that forces people into doing activities for activity's sake, uh, that punishes people for being unemployed, um, to a system that actually supports people to uh, get a career that they want, um, that is more so based on trust than compliance, uh, and that is actually tailored to meet people's needs so that we don't have this cookie cutter approach to employment services and that we have a system that actually helps people. Uh, because at the end of the day, I think uh, we all want a system that supports people to build themselves up rather than uh, pushes them down. Um, so I, I might finish um, by saying that um, although I, I don't think that a UBI is just around the corner, <laughs> I think we are in a really excellent position to create a fairer system uh, that ensures that every one of us um, is protected against economic insecurity and that we have a true safety net for when we need it. Uh, and that we have a model that um, supports all of us to thrive uh, and, and build the lives that we want. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Charmaine. Thanks, Charmaine. Thanks for really you know, getting to the you know, brass tacks, I guess, of, of, of welfare and, and the policies and the, the lobbying and the, and, and the work that's currently being done and also the effect that, as you've mentioned quite a few times, um, the, the current COVID payments have actually really made on people's lives in Australia. Um, we'll be hearing more from Charmaine later during the Q&A. Um, yeah. We're now gonna, yeah? <laughs> Do you wanna say something more, sorry? No, I don't. No. <laughs> um, I'm gonna throw it to David Pledger. Do you yeah. wanna introduce David? So David Pledger, we're really excited to have David in today. Um, so David is a contemporary artist working with and between the performing visual and media arts in Australia, Asia and Europe. Uh, so David regularly comments on matters of artistic practice, cultural pos policy and arts activism, as well as the artist's relationship to society. So we're really excited to hear what David has to say. So we're going to cross live now to David. Thanks, David. Thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. My name is David Pledge and I'm the very recently appointed Minister for Artists. I'd like to read from a prepared statement, if I might. As of this morning, dated Thursday, May 28, 2020, the federal government has instituted a series of significant changes to its arts and cultural policy. The following changes will be made and, where appropriate, changes to the relevant legislation will take effect immediately. The Australia Council for Arts Organisations will be renamed the Australia Council for Artists. The distribution of agency funds that has hitherto privileged major organisations over smaller organisations and independent practising professional artists will be inverted. The arts industry will be newly described as the artists industry or the industry of artists. I know I don't think we can legislate that one. No? TBC, we're going to do a TBC on that one. Uh, the Social Security Transition Act will be amended to provide a new assignation for artists that provide an exemption to reporting requirements which will relieve them of the burden of proof of job seeking outside their profession. Board positions on all arts and cultural institutions and arts companies will be spilt. 75% of these vacant positions will be made available to artists. Artistic directorships and directorates, that is CEO positions of all arts and cultural institutions and arts companies will be filled by practicing professional artists, thus providing working life pathways for those with a skill set, that is artists. These changes will come into effect immediately where appropriate or in transitional stages where necessary. The prime minister himself has instigated these changes after experiencing a road to Damascus moment. In tongues this morning, the PM said, and this is a translation, our economic recovery will be highly creative. Our new economy will be artist led. All media inquiries should be directed to the PM's chief of staff. So taking up my ministerial hat, I'd like to acknowledge the lands of future uh, First Nations peoples on which I have worked and lived. And uh, those are the cooler nations on which I parent, uh, currently live and work. I'd like to say that the miracle that uh, has been outlined by the media release is probably the only government intervention that can save Australian artists from the servitude that they've been subjected to for some years. Uh, that or the UBI, uh, at least uh, the discourse surrounding the UBI. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'd like to tell you a story. It's a short story of the material conditions in which Australian artists lived before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. From 1990 to 2010, direct funding for individual artists in Australia fell by one third. So that's over a 20 year period. Now a significant part of direct funding for individual artists is funneled through Australia's National Arts Agency, the Australia Council for the Arts. So statistics relevant to the agency are a pretty good indicator. Um, the agency's own research tracks reductions in artist populations and the ever increasing precarity of the artist's life. These conditions are often linked to the material conditions of Australia's small to medium arts sector. Over the last five years, the number of small to medium arts organisations funded by the National Arts Agency decreased by 34%. As such, the small to medium sector has disappeared. There is now only a small sector. Conversely, the major performing arts organisations have increased by 8% in the last two years. According to the agency's most recent annual report, 75% of its funding goes to organisations, 59% of which is protected for major organisations and 16% of which is competitive for the small sector. The remaining 25% is split across council initiatives like audience development, professional development programs, marketing webinars, international engagement and projects to support independent arts practice. As of March 2020, when the $5 million resilience fund was announced, support for independent arts practice constituted a rather strange fraction, 1 37th of the Australia Council's total budget of $185 million to be made available to the nation's 50,000 plus practicing professional artists. It's not very much, is it? But the COVID pandemic hasn't really caused any of this. It simply brought into sharp relief the working reality of the Australian artist, a consequence of the interweaving of colonialism, capitalism and patriarchy into the fabric of mainstream political and economic culture, and ultimately the public sector and civil society. It's the holy trinity of neoliberal power 
that divides, disturbs, and alienates, and has an abiding disdain for the plurality of ideas, feelings, and senses that generate and receive the arts. In this paternalistic system, artists will always be fetishized, patronized, and financially discriminated against. When bailouts are proposed, artists will be last in line. Institutions always will be privileged above the individual's artist's needs in this system. It's built on a value set in which the artist is expendable. It's a consequence of erasing social value in the process of reducing all activity to the financial. It's just how the system works. And the art sector is hardwired now to behave in this way. Artists have shifted their language from sustainability to survival to extinction. So what happens on a micro level in the art sector is a distillation of what happens on a micro level in our society. The values and behaviours of one are the values and behaviours of the other. They, they feed into each other. Hence the extrusion of casual workers, including artists and arts workers, from the job seeker payment. Which brings us to an alternative to the aforementioned miracle. So for the last seven years, I've made an argument for a living wage for artists. My advocacy is the result of a process of analysis that concluded with the opinion that the art sector, for the reasons I've outlined, will not undertake its own process of redistribution of existing and future funds that would balance work with fairness, equity and productivity. And that would act as an example in its representations to government. So I wanna be clear, my idea didn't arise out of any expertise specific to the discourse of the UBI. Sure hand, I'm not an expert like the previous speakers. But as I've interrogated the merits of a living wage for artists, I've been drawn to thinking of what a UBI might mean for artists. And I've made some observations that might be useful in this form. Firstly, the UBI has lots of aliases. The universal resilience dividend, the universal social dividend, the universal well-being payment, the living wage, a livable income, emergency basic income, there's loads more. There's a really interesting proposition that's circulating around in these circles in Australia, uh, led by Marianne Cosgrove called Just Now, that creates a narrative with plot lines that include jobs creation, universal social dividend, and tax reform. There's also an argument that Australia's already had a very singular experience of the UBI when the Rudd government dropped $900 into our bank accounts to save us from the global financial crisis. There's a lot of contest in this space. But it seems to me that any national scheme needs to be customised to factors specific to each society, such as culture, geography, the kind of economy, and pressing needs of the environment. This whole of society approach makes the UBI a meaningful proposition for addressing the financial discrimination that characterises our art sector because it can include all of us. And there's a moral dimension to this discussion as well. Guy Standing, one of uh, UBI's leading global advocates, wrote a book called New Precariat, of which he spoke last week in a webinar organised by the Green Institute. He said that a member of the Precariat, it's a quote, is a supplicant. You have to ask for favours from a parent, a bureaucrat, an employer. And to me, this describes the servile position of the Australian artist, always looking up to the financial tables at which we're not allowed to sit, always waiting for the crumbs to fall. It's not very dignified, is it? A UBI would take the prick out of our collective neck and restore some dignity to our work and our daily life. Another aspect is equity. A UBI acknowledges the worth of all citizens and enshrines basic rights of justice, freedom and security. It can relieve the burden of our ancestral or family history and so help mitigate the rise of class, which is a fundamental driver of social and cultural inequity in Australia. And for artists, well, we could come in from the cold fringes of society into the warmer climes of the mainstream, which becomes more inclusive than what it is now. And a third point is that a level of financial security provided by UBI would allow us to escape the so-called arts industry, which for artists is a mirage. It's an entirely problematic construction that is driven by a comparatively well-paid managerialist class that fetishizes the artist and cannibalizes their need to create. The growth of this class is directly linked to the colonization of the artist. The question I've asked many times over the last years is, 
how do you characterize a human activity as an industry when a third of its primary producers, artists, live below the poverty line? So there are both contextual and actual issues at play here. In actual terms, a UBI will most likely drag the Australian artist out from under the poverty line. And in contextual terms, the oppressive ambience of the art sector would be mitigated simply by an external correction of the gross inequity that prevents the art sector from operating fairly and productively. I'd like to close with this reflection, and it speaks to some of the questions that have popped up. A few years ago, I was invited to write in a publication on the dramaturgy of the universal basic income. And in it, I described how as a younger artist, I'd been on unemployment benefits for about eight years. And I was heading overseas to take up a position at the Korean National University of Arts. And I decided then and there that I would not apply for benefits on my return. More than 20 years on, I've established an international and national arts practice. And as the head of a small arts company, I've employed hundreds of artists and arts workers. I remember at the time thinking that that social security context had inadvertently given me a living wage. It was never a disincentive to work, just a useful base from which I could create with and for others. Thank you. In a nutshell, about the relevance of the artist and the artist-led economy and the benefits that something like a UBI could actually really have for the people that we're currently calling artists. Um, and so maybe there's no better way to kind of follow that up than to have a conversation um, with Citizen Coombs who have uh, been working away uh, with around about 20 to 30 other people, people um, uh, amazing, amazing advocates um, around Australia and some internationally as well. Um, yeah, so I think what we're going to try and do now is um, have a chat to Courtney and Antoinette if they're there in Zoom. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about their work that they've created um, alongside the symposium, mm. a performance for a world without creativity. And we're going to talk a little bit about their collaborative practice as well, because they're both artists who work um, separately as well as together. And um, I guess the idea of coming together, the collaborative kind of nature is really relevant to what we're doing now. Yeah, as well. absolutely. Hi, Antoinette. Hello, Courtney. Hi, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> how are you doing out there? I am doing well. I've been really enjoying watching you guys. It's been a fantastic evening tonight. <laughs> well, it's nice to hear. Um, and Courtney, how are you going in, in the crypt pad with the advocates? Yes, there's been some um, lots of rich kind of discussion happening on the pad, I think, lots of provocations and reflections. And it's been really wonderful to see how passionate um, everyone is about this topic, actually. So I think that's something, yeah, that I've been enjoying is like hearing our own individual thoughts reflected back to us, which is so affirming. That's super cool. Maybe it'd be worth us if we um, share the screen and have a look at what's been happening in the crypt pad. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, I'll just share my Thanks. screen now. You might have to get in a little bit closer to your device <laughs> wherever you are and squint your eyes a little bit and you can see this little pad. So what we've got here is the list that uh, was previously developed on Tuesday that's been added to over the last couple of days by Citizen Coons. And um, I reckon that list is going to probably keep going. Is, is that a safe assumption? Yeah, I think that um, sometimes we, you hit a brick wall when you're trying to make make the list happen and that's why we always work with other people um so for mm -hmm. us i think bringing in all of those voices is really important and i'd love to see this list keep going because as we know there are so many things that we would not be able to enjoy without those who are operating within the gig economy yeah totally i think you know it's endless and um and, it, and it's evolving which is why we collaborate isn't it and um we we're just saying before that uh, your your collaborative uh, relationship is a little bit different from your own personal uh, visual art practices as well. 
Um, can you maybe just talk quickly a little bit about what, what it means to both of you to collaborate and for so long with each other? Well, we begun collaborating uh, in, I believe it was 2008. Is that right, Courtney? Yeah. Um, when we started uh, with two other people, we started a, a artist run initiative and um, Kate Woodcroft and Catherine Sagan uh, worked collaboratively and Courtney and I worked collaboratively and we came together to create the Artist Run Initiative. Um, and we've been making work um, very sporadically, might I say, since then. It sounds like there's a bit of a theme going here. It's like the artist led, artist run, art, you know, like why are we all so obsessed with artists, you know, being in charge of things? Well, if we Maybe don't do it, who else can do it? We're in charge of anything, <laughs> so we have to do it for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's also about community, right? Like I think being an artist is being connected with other people who see the world or want to see the world from a particular perspective, and I think there's real joy in coming together and trying to, trying to um, imagine a different way of being. I think that's what artists kind of do best, right? And so when we get... It's nice to do that with other people. Totally. Absolutely. I think another kind of point to add to that too is that uh, you might have seen at the very beginning the artist farmer, the artist carer, the artist lover, the artist is so many other things um, and that we, you know, that multiplicity I suppose is what, where the joy is in the artist-led space, in the artist-led economy, mm. in things that we like to drive collaboratively with other people, I guess. Yeah. Totally. And I think that that list is, a, you know, endless too and, and exhaustive. It's like, you know, what do we do? What is our practice? Yeah. How do we care? How do we do community? How do we, you know, work with each other? How do we learn? I've, I've learned so much from you two just in the last four days of engaging with you in this, you know, cool project. And, um, you know, that's nice. Didn't have to pay for that. I mean, you know, <laughs> didn't have to go to school for it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you want to kind of, uh, you've, mm. you've made list works before, you made a list work for uh, space and Greater we've Together? Had this um, iteration twice before, um, first at West Space and then at ACA. Um, it was on a different type of list. We were doing, we started with a performance for activities that require two or more people. Um, it, and yeah. so on that, did you find, obviously we're not going to know without going through that process and it was quite a rigorous discussion when we were all in the Zoom kind of trying to define what we were going to talk about in terms of creativity, what it was. Um, did you find it um, easier just stating things that require two more, or more people or was it much the same? Just a lot of... There you go. <laughs> I was just gonna say it's always a debate. Whatever yeah. topic that you pick, it's always going to be a debate. <laughs> and that's why we love it, I think, because it, everyone sees things so differently and we're not here to dictate the answers. We're not we are not interested. Otherwise we'd just write the list ourselves, right? Um, we're very much interested in having those conversations um, and questioning and being questioned, I think. Like that's a big part of the process for us as well. And it's amazing how much you can learn just in a short process of trying to write a list collaboratively, you know? Like I think that it's, um, yeah, it surprises me each time, I think. It's something really you know, obviously the, the multiplicity of approaches that you've got and that kind of we have and, you know, this thing about that which, you know, just speaks volumes and I think we need to just keep going with it. I'm, I'm interested actually if we can go back to the crib pad a little bit and go to the bottom and see some of the contributions from the advocates. And um, I will just share it now. There has yeah. been lots of um, discussion. Excellent. Now, has anything jumped out at you as uh, resounding and needs to be amplified? I was, I don't know if it needs to be amplified, but I was really interested in this idea that artists are farmed, you know, like we talk about mm. co-opting, but I don't know, just that that language, I think, around that. 
mm. was interesting to me as a way to think about it. I'd never thought about it in that way. I think that um, that really relates back to what David was talking about in his presentation and about, you know, working within an industry where as the primary kind of producers, we mm. don't really see a return for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we do sometimes. It's not very consistent. Cool. Yeah, There's some really cool <laughs> ideas in here. Some really yeah. wacky stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, thank you so much, you two. And, um, you know, good luck with um, evolving this project and, and what happens next. Thank you. Um, thank you. Congratulations. I, I look forward to getting into that CryptoPad properly after. Yeah, yeah, let's get in there. <laughs> hey, no one in the advocate group, delete your stuff. We need to keep working with yeah. that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to throw to a wonderful little uh, video uh, work. <laughs> That's that camera there. Um, a, a little sting that uh, Sarah Jane Woolahan has put together. And um, after that, we're going to go to the Q&A with the panellists and the agitators. Yeah. Okay, hi everyone. <laughs> so what we're doing now is we're jumping into Zoom and we're adding everybody into the call. So we're about to start the Q&A. Um, so we're probably just going to have to be a little bit patient while we yeah. get everything up. Got a couple more. We've got waiting for Vivian. We've got all of our presenters. There's Yoni. Hello. Hello, Vivian. Hello, Nithya. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, David. Hello, Greg. <laughs> Charmaine. Loriana. Nick Thomas. And Lucy in the corner there. Um, has everybody got their audio on? We're ready to jump in and all talk at exactly the same time. Time starts now. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bunch of questions that have come from the agitators and um, some informed by what the advocates have been putting forward. Um, the way we're going to operate this is that we're just going to select some of these questions and get the agitators to ask them uh, directly to their favourite panellist at this stage. Not favourite, but you know what I mean. Um, so <laughs> we're going to start with Nithya. Nithya has a question for Greg Marston. Some solid foundation for 
um, you know, I guess it's going forward with this without the fear that we introduce the basic income rule, uh, you know, wouldn't engage in, in paid employment. Having said that, I think that at the same time you want to, as we're talking about in terms of the cultural politics, you know, open up all the ways in which people make a contribution, but recognising that it's a really difficult task because these myths run very deep in our society, particularly around deserving and undeserving, as Laureana was talking about. They go back to the Elizabethan poor laws, the principle of lesser eligibility, you know, which said that basically you've always got to make the, part, the, the worst paid job look better than um, state support, you know, and we've also always had a very strong surveillance approach and control approach to people in poverty. Um, we used to have the workhouses in the 1800s and now we've got the equivalent of what um, Virginia Eubanks calls the digital poorhouse, you know, the way in which we track people in terms of, um, you know, what they're doing and declaring income. And of course, in this country, we had the the infamous robo debt scandal that kind of you know painted all of the the ways in which we spend a lot of time and a lot of money surveilling people when we'd be much better putting that money into people's pockets because the problem is not as um charmaine was talking about that we need to condition how people spend the money we just need to give people enough money to meet all of their essential services and people will spend that money wisely so there has to be more trust built into the system and certainly you know the cultural challenge i think is as important as the economic distribution because in this country you have to look at the policies that we've just announced in response to the pandemic job appears in all of them you know, job seeker job keeper uh, job maker um you know i'm waiting for job baker next week you know we'll throw in some flour some, some yeast knead a little bit uh, and, and hopefully it will rise right but you know basically as people have said what they've done is provide people with an economic insecurity we pause some of the conditionality you know, that we are providing a form of economic security and we should be proud of that and stand up for it rather than, um, you know, put it all through the prism of, of job and work. And I think that that's, that's a tragedy. And it's also a very one-dimensional view of what constitutes, you know, humanity and a good society. So it's care work that's made us get through this pandemic. It's solidarity. Um, we need to reward those workers at the front line and pay them more, certainly not detracting from labour market inequalities but you know we also just need to recognize that if you give people a basic economic security then lots of the other problems we worry about will go away at least in my view when i'm optimistic thanks greg that leads into the next question actually really perfectly so the next question i think that vivian you wanted to ask a question to loriana your first question the, the big one the big one <laughs> Just looking for what I've read earlier. Next time we'll have another so, crypt. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, it's all good. You go. You ready? Yes. Basic income may enable us to shift from an exploitative extractivist capitalism to an ethics of care that respects the dignity of all life forms. And Pope Francis recently advocated for um, the need for a universal basic income and said that now is the time for people to be put at the centre, united to heal, to care and to share. But care work, as we know, is often performed behind the scenes and taken for granted. It tends to be poorly paid, if at all. Yet without such work, human beings wouldn't survive. In what ways do you think, Lariana, that basic income can grant visibility and to and privilege economies of care, bringing them back to the centre of how we operate as a society? Thank you very much, Vivian. That's an amazing question. And I think that is at the core of, uh, of my previous argument in the sense that, so universal basic income is just simply a policy instrument. You know, the way and the effects that it will have on society it really depends on how we frame it. So on the values, this is why I was talking about the vision. So what, what kind of society are we aiming for? And obviously, so the presentation I gave before and the way I see universal basic income is of a system uh, embedded in a discourse where care is the fundamental value, because it recognizes our species primarily as a 
caretaking species because that's what, what we are. We are social beings. And so I think universal basic income per se. So if you were to introduce universal basic income within this system, within the dominant hegemonic discourses, no, this will not automatically lead to an increased visibility of care work. I don't, I, I don't think we can assume any direct link. So it has to do with the, with the discourses, with the stories that we tell about each other. So we are in implementing a universal income because we do value a set of contribution. And we think that care is a solid fundamental way in which we as humans contribute to the well-being of the collective, I think. So it's not just paid work, you know, it's a very narrow, narrow, narrow limitation um, imposed on what we as humans can do. Um, so it, yes, it's a tricky question because again, per se, it will not cause this shift. It's how do we frame it, uh, you know, within what, yeah, broader discourse for social change do we frame it? I think that's, you know, one based again on intrinsic value of care. Yeah. Hope it answers it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, we've got a question for Charmaine here from Nithya. Charmaine, I think a lot of people would um, agree with the, the idea that probably our current government is not going to bring in a UBI um, tomorrow. <laughs> but um, like we've seen with the doubling of uh, job keepers, I'm wondering if, uh, sorry, job seekers, <laughs> I'm wondering if... Um, you think that what there might be some other elements of a UBI that are that we can implement temporarily or that we can implement in this environment. Um, I thought what you said about the income floor was really interesting. Um, so I guess the, the two part question first is the elements that you think we can fight for temporarily that are possible under this government. Um, and the second part is where you've seen um, something like an income floor work maybe in a micro set of economies, whether it's a set of organizations, um, a, a local or a state-based um, scheme, and if that's something that we should be opting for to try and bring in a, a um, localized UBI as or an mm. LBI, uh, a localized basic income instead of, of opting for the, the, the grand scheme in the, um, in the first run. Yeah, thanks so much, really good questions. Um, I'd argue that much of what the government has done in its response to COVID uh, reflects much of what we would want uh, or want to see in a UBI or um, even an income floor. So um, as I mentioned, they've, they've made a quite a large number of changes to facilitate access to the social security system, which has had the effect of, um, you know, while it's not totally universal system, we're, it's taken us a long way there. So um, they've done things like remove the assets test for the unemployment payment. Um, they've also expanded the income test for couples. Um, so couples with an income of up to 80,000 now can access that payment. So that's had the effect of bringing um, a large number of, I guess, higher wealth or higher income households into the system. Um, which I think is interesting in itself that they've done that, right? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they've uh, removed a lot of the barriers to getting income support. And I'm really hopeful that many of those conditions that have been suspended temporarily can actually be abolished on the other side of this. So things like the liquid assets waiting period, which is this horrible thing where if you've got, you know, more than $5,000 in the bank, you can't access an unemployment payment. Never mind that we all need some kind of, you know, uh, level of money in the bank in case the fridge goes bust, bust just as, you know, the story I told earlier indicated. So um, I think there are actually many things in the government's response that it can continue relatively easily. Uh, and that puts us in good stead to have a more universal system in the future, if that's the way we're headed. Um, to your point of um, where this has 
perhaps been done at a smaller level. Um, look, I think Greg touched on it earlier, but the, the Finnish UBI experiment was really interesting and um, they've done some decent evaluation of it. Um, the latest evaluation report found that whilst it did not increase uh, levels of employment among participants, it also didn't lead to a decrease and it actually gave people more confidence. Um, they had a they had improved well-being. Uh, so for the cohort who was unemployed who participated in that, there were actually some really great outcomes, which um, I think um, provides a really great lesson for the rest of us. Um, there has been um, some suggestion that perhaps we do do a localised model here in Australia. Eva Cox has suggested that the cashless debit card trial sites be transferred to a, a UBI um, or a LBI <laughs> trial uh, to see how that would, would go in action here. Um, I, I don't think the government is taking that <laughs> proposal <laughs> um, too enthusiastically, but, um, you know, I think it is an interesting um, thing to look at, especially in some of those areas where the prospect of getting uh, sustainable and secure paid work over the long term is next to none, you know, in some of these remote communities, they just aren't the jobs for people to access. So what is the solution there, you know? Um, should we subject them, you know, penalise these people with this completely evidence-free card or, um, you know, should we look at other models that, uh, um, you know, help people to, um, you know, go down their own path? And, and I think that's an interesting idea for Australia. Thanks. Thanks for that, Shane. So we've got a question now, um, Rebecca Conroy, you wrote a question um, and it's about um, Loriana's ideas about storytelling um, and the power of discourse. And I thought that this could be a really interesting question. Maybe if Loriana could speak to it as well as David. Did you want to ask that question? Sure. Um, but before I ask the question, I just want to comment on the amazing community television set that you've got going. <laughs> I'm just like just gagging to say something about that. I'm just loving it all. Um, and hi can everyone. I just, just comment that this is an amazing sculpture that has been donated to this community <laughs> television set by an amazing <laughs> artist called Andrew Hustwaite at the last minute. We're like, what the fuck can we hang in the background? And called him up and he's like, yeah, I've got this. Thing. It's a hundred percent authentic community television. It's like, <laughs> it's, really, it's really nailed it. So well done. Um, yeah, and hi everyone, and thanks to to the hosts and producing this um, very important topic to talk about. Um, I'm zooming in from uh, Gadigal, Bidjigal country from east in Sydney near the ocean. Um, so my questions, I mean, I just had a comment. Just a lot of the um, contribution that Lorianna was talking about just reminded me of the the kind of the strength and the power of discourse just you know on one level we've got this kind of you know debate about you know can we afford it what what would policy wise what would we need to change but the most profoundly kind of i guess for my as an artist as well is thinking about how do we shift this narrative there seems to be like so much work that needs to be done just to shift this narrative and it got me thinking about the you know, the William Golding Lord of the Flies, because it was recently in the spotlight that the original story, you know, the story that, that draws from is uh, a true, you know, a real story about six Samoan boys who were who were shipwrecked for, for 16 months uh, on an island. And it's just that story about Lord of the Flies that we've kind of had to accept, that it's the version of humanity that tells us we're oh we're just going to destroy each other we're all about competition and that is not actually the story that represents most of the world um and it was just ironic that it, what it represented was william golding's version of the world and he he was by a lot of accounts not a, pr a pretty terrible man um, so it just made me think about that, you know, the, the strength of the discourse. The discourse is a really powerful, very material force. Um, and I really liked that. And I also just, David, I just could not get that cooking show metaphor out of my head. You know, like the, the, the stats are so 
terrible. Um, like, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I needed to hear that, you know, one thirty seventh. Um, but I, you know, it is really stark. And I just, I just imagine that as a kind of what what metaphors are we most relating to? You know, like if we could have, if we could visualize that as someone who was eating was getting more of a share of the pie and literally mm. stuffing themselves, you know, like it feels like there's this real um, uh, a scarcity that's happening on, like we're, we're so malnourished on this side and then there's this bloating on the other side. So just something to think about as a future cooking show. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great idea to a cooking. It's like Le Grand Booth. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, the uh, the artists will be the little mice picking up after the end of it. The- <laughs> That's right. It's, the tragedy is on us. Yeah. The tragedy is definitely on us. But the little crumbs off the table, yes, it's pathetic. It is actually like that, though, that kind of um, thinking about how do we value ourselves and what we go in for and what we ask the government for is, you know, we just have a little bit just a little yeah. tiny tiny little bit oh thank you so much thank you that's so great I think, um, uh, one of yeah. the advocacy that we've really uh, uh failed in in terms of the arts is that never ask for what you think you you can get ask for what you need yeah because in this kind of environment this work we've been operating in uh, that has never worked in any space, but particularly for the arts, which I know well. Mm. I think there's a really interesting um, connection between your two points, really, because, I mean, you're, you're sort of invoking uh, Mr. Rutger Bregman and his, you know, uh, a hopeful history. And oh, I, yes. Yes, he's an optimist. What I like about what he, what he's doing and what a number of people are trying to do and what you wrote down in that, you know, the in your in your um, in the chat is that actually if we if we change our default setting to uh, humans are basically good rather than humans are basically bad we recalibrate pretty much all the values that generate our social policy yeah that includes the arts and that's the that is a so instead of a dystopian uh, default setting, and certainly not a utopian fault setting, but maybe a, a, a third kind of default setting that's really comes from, you know, looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, I am many kinds of persons, um, but what I'm not predominantly is a bad person. I am not William Golding. I am actually, you know, I, I would like to think that I could be in that group of boys on the island who took care of each other and agreed that they wouldn't fight. Mm. That's a great place for us to start thinking about what we can do. It doesn't mean that there's no contest. It actually means that the rules of the contest are defined by a sense of humanity rather than deprivation. Yeah, and I think there were some other speakers that were drawing on the idea of this you know, demonising of the poor that mm. poverty is seen as a moral failing or it's, and even on the left as well, it's seen as kind of still quite a paternal attitude that the left have. Oh, we've got to help the poor get out of their problems instead of asking why are they poor in the first place, you know? So addressing that that idea of there's so much um, emotion that's and judgment that's wrapped up in, in these um, positions, yeah. Thank you. Um, sh- actually, before we go to the next question, um, uh, Lauriana, did you want to make any comment on that? Because it kind of stemmed from, you know, stuff you were saying. Um, you don't have to, of course, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just like uh, to comment on this whole uh, discourse and this construction of the human being as uh, competitive uh, rather than cooperative. And again, it comes from a view of history that has been very selective, you know, and we tend to forget that as a species, we lived pretty much 90% of our time in very cooperative, um, more tribal collectivist um, settings. So there must be a reason, you know, if we evolve where we got to where we are, which must must be related to cooperation rather than competition, which as we're witnessing is not taking us very far, I guess. Yes, Charmaine. 
Just adding to your point, Rebecca, um, having a low income then also leads to um, organisations, I agree with you, including from the left, going, oh, well, we have to fix them somehow, you know, and that's where we have these policies like, like the drug testing proposal, right? The idea is, oh, well, you're poor because you're a drug addict, and so we need to fix the drug addiction, right? Rather than go, actually, you're poor because your income is too low, and that's the what we need to do. So, yeah, just want to put that in there. Great. Thank you. Oh, Thomas yes. Wants to speak. Thomas wants to speak. Release Thomas from the mute. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps unmute yourself. Yeah, good. Well, can we do it ourselves? <laughs> Thanks so much. So um, that reminded me of, um, so we all agree here, obviously. And I was just thinking, are we all in a bubble? And how can we reach the quiet Australians, which we know they are, and how, because we need them, we need them to build up the social pressure to get this uh, thing. So it doesn't have to be UBI, of course, but we all know we need to fix the welfare, sy welfare system in, in some way together to achieve something like uh, marriage equality, which was unavoidable because there was so much social pressure. And we had, we had um, fighters on the left and in the churches who put so much resources into a fight against marriage equality. They couldn't withstand, they couldn't uh, defend their position because that was such social pressure that it needed to happen. And I believe we need something similar to fix this. So I think that, um, re, uh, speaking of the church, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that leads really nicely onto a question that, Yoni, you had for everybody, but I wonder if maybe Nick and Thomas might, might want to speak to it first. It was the question According about... According to some scholars... Oh, cool. Is it unmuted now? Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yes, according to some scholars, um, well, several scholars really, uh, this is a pretty general question, uh, more philosophical question, really, but it sort of occurred to me that some of the uh, fundamental, fundamental notions like creativity and freedom are, have been thrown out there without further elaboration. And um, as far as I understand, and according to many scholars, both freedom and creativity come from the pretty theological Christian ideas um, that relate to initially in, in medieval theology, the power of God to whether God can control the world completely or whether God's freedom is restricted. And then, um, you know, what we consider creative to be a notion of creativity develops from these ideas because individuals start to think of themselves as being able to manifest the will of God by creating artworks through a power that they have. And so that's to simplify like 400 years of Christian philosophy. But anyway, and so I just, it seems to me like we're borrowing ideas of um, creativity and art and freedom that are highly individualized, highly theological, um, that rest on notions of uh, Christian and monotheistic ideas of creation of the world. So th they're very, very different than indigenous or tribal notions that the world has always existed. Um, and so the, the, the heavy Christian legacy of modern art and modern individualism might raise some issues that we want to discuss. Maybe it's, it, it's too broad a question, but, but the, the debate, these, the, most of this debate seems to me to rest on very libertarian individualistic principles and so we're deeply embedded in the neoliberal discourse that we're trying to criticize um and i think it has to do with yeah. something you can um respond to in relation to that very heavy and heady um <laughs> bit of factoid in question yeah are they talking to us yeah. sorry Dario, who was that question for 
Uh, for Nick and Thomas, so I just took a general question, and I, I'm interested just because Thomas talked a little bit about you know the kind of uh, you know the, uh, um, the uh, yes to same sex marriage situation in Australia and how you know um, that really kind of pushed through a Christian narrative, and so you know I think that maybe there's something that we could uh, maybe Thomas and Nick could talk a bit about what you've just kind of mentioned in relation to that legacy and what that really means and how we can push through the neoliberal discourse and beyond that actually the the neoliberal actual ide ideologies that you're saying maybe are informing the idea around ubi correct okay well as an accountant uh, i'll try <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i probably won't talk from to the um theology maybe that kind of aspect as much but I'll talk personally about maybe my experience a little bit and where I, I mean, I see art and creativity as connecting humans together, essentially. And that, that's how I kind of think about it in, in the practice in the business school. It's about how do we bring humanity back into a business school, essentially, um, where often that human nature, that human connection, that idea of collaboration is actually kind of taken out. We, we, kind of talk about our discipline a lot in a binary context. There's a right or a wrong, there's an ob We teach it like a, a pure science. It's an objective way of doing something rather than a social construction. So when our students graduate and they leave and they go into those kind of professional environments and they practice their craft or their art, uh, they see it in a very scientific way that this is completely regiment. It's, it's in place, it's immovable and we just need to comply and do what we need to do to survive mm -hmm. or to, to, to obviously go up the chain and, and create that profit driven notion. So where I think about accounting, as I think art and thinking about art and accounting together is that art brings that human nature back into the accounting to turn it into some form of accountability. And so I, I know I haven't answered the question, but I'm not, to me, art becomes although it's something in the individual as a human connection, it's connecting us with each other and creates something in a collaborative form. Go, Loriana. Release Loriana. <laughs> yes, I would like to address this question probably more on the, on the freedom uh, side rather than the creative side, even though the creative side certainly has a lot to be thought about. And our theology and Christianity, in fact, informs its part of our culture as well. So from the freedom side, I think we should not make the mistake of merging neoliberalism with libertarianism as a philosophy. Uh, they are not exactly the same thing. And the concept of freedom within uh, libertarian thinking, which, you know, again, it's part of our culture, because going back in time in our history and in the philosophy, that has um, underpinned this history. We are, we are daughters and sons of the Enlightenment. So there is this concept of freedom. Yes, that it's individualized. So in the in the libertarian conception of freedom, the freedom to choose, uh, to say no. Of course, it's an individual conception of freedom. But uh, I also think that it would be even more utopic or dystopic to imagine to you know completely get rid of this that is so embedded in us now. And uh, um, so the libertarian conception of freedom does not deny the other version of freedom. We coexist also in our culture. So you can have both. You know, you can think of yourself as an individual who can self-determine themselves and also think of yourself as part of that system. And they, they exist together in our culture. And we have to acknowledge our culture. And that's the starting point to design, um, you know, a culturally specific UBI, I think. Thanks. Does anybody else want to add to that uh, discuss there, or can we throw to another question before we open back out? And I think we it might be nice. Nick and Thomas, are you staying with us, or do you have to head away? And awesome, great. And then maybe we can go back to uh, uh, what Thomas was talking about before, and kind of evolve from there in regards to you know what might be possible. I just want to go back to something, Vivian. You pointed out a very specific question um, that I think uh, would be good for our accountants. Um, in regards to um, uh, Australian, the Australian context and the history in Australia and the labour context specifically? Yeah, thanks, Dario. Yeah, we earlier were talking about the fact that 
In Australia, UBI is not a new idea. And in fact, it was proposed in the 1970s as part of an inquiry into poverty that was commissioned by the then Whitlam government. Mm. And one of the key recommendations was guaranteed minimum income. In fact, my grandfather worked on one of the reports, which was called Poverty and Education in Australia. Unfortunately, as we know, those recommendations were shelved when Fraser came in and the mentality of life isn't meant to be easy became the kind of motto of the day. And poverty, as we've discussed earlier, was seen as a moral failing. But my, my interest now is in this situation of the pandemic where we're all vulnerable to a new kind of poverty. We're very much aware that poverty can happen to anyone. And I think, you know, can we, if we can, how can we harness this collective new sensitivity to the realities of poverty? Is it, is it possible to find a way of implementing UBI in Australia, um, taking a bit of a lead from what, what was produced in the 1970s, so reconnecting with something that's already been happening here? That's yeah, definitely. General question. Um, we don't have to invent the wheel. The wheel is there already, and there are so many models, uh, which I gave a glimpse in, in our presentation of. And, but, if you think about it, it all comes back to does our current society, do they really want it? If they wanted it, we had it already. So I'm, I'm not sure, um, yeah, um, if, if we had that social pressure, um, we would find ways, we, we would have to political, I think that the greatest barrier is just the political will and um, we as citizens have to convince our governments, our member of parliaments to work on this and to get it through. And again, I can only come up with something like um, marriage equality, we, we could come up with other social um, changes we had in the past, um, uh, abolishment of, of slavery, all those things um, happened because um, there was enough social pressure to make them happen. And, and so um, I think it, it, maybe it was a good way now at this stage to use um, what you were referring to the pandemic to use that experience of many people who weren't in that situation before in that situation of insecurity and um, uncertainty in an economic way maybe that's a good point um, a good gateway to get into their thinking and educate them um, accordingly and and bring the idea that there is actually other ways we can do things, we can organize our welfare um, system. Did you want to add anything to that, Greg? I saw you raising your hand. Uh, just quickly, I know Charmaine wants to make a contribution too. Um, I was just going to say that the other difference about the Rondon Hamilton inquiry was that, um, you know, Henderson and all the people that worked on that report and the multiple reports, you know, they talked to, to people who are homeless, um, voices of people who were poor. And this was the first time really that, that that had been the case. And when we look at welfare reform at the moment, the, the expertise of people who are in the situation is not put front and centre in all the successive welfare reforms. So I think those voices are really important in challenging some of those uh, stereotypes. The other thing I say about how we get social security systems the big change is that often those kind of exogenous shocks, right? So it's kind of wars and depression, unfortunately, that turn, you know, private troubles into public problems. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when we got mass unemployment that we started to get the welfare state. But we also had a tax system that could pay for it because they had just funded the war effort. So social security became the kind of peacetime aim. So, you know, history, I think, is instructive in that sense, but we don't need, there are lots of good ideas, but hopefully going forward, we don't need, um, you know, another depression or another pandemic uh, to point that way. But I think the other thing that I think is worth holding on to is that there might be some greater respect for all sorts of expertise out of this. If you look at how we responded to the crisis, it's been the public health folks and the epidemiologists that, you know, politicians where the countries have got it right, I listen to them. 
Um, and if we could see some of that retained when we look at problems like climate change uh, or bushfires, um, which is linked to climate change, then I think we'd be in a much better place too. But, but that expertise needs to be you know, of people who are both in that experience, but also the people that you know actually know something about the subject. I mean, otherwise we get a whole lot of populism and fear and all these ridiculous you know, assertions, basically, rather than arguments. And I think that's not that's not good public policy. Yeah, I just I just adding on to that and um, following on from Thomas's comment earlier uh, about bringing the the quiet Australians with us. Um, we did some messaging work for the campaign we're running to increase unemployment payments, both before the last election, so early 2019, and we're just doing a new round now. Um, and it's been fascinating seeing the difference. Uh, so, you know, for um, somewhat moderate groups in, back in 2019, there was still a very clear thing that, you know, unemployed people are bludgers and they shouldn't get any more money. And even among unemployed people themselves, they were saying, well, look, I should get an increase, but other unemployed people, it should be, you know, restricted to the cashless debit card. Like there was that kind of like mentality. But now much more empathy. There is much greater understanding of what's going on for people. And we're really heartened by that. I mean, there's some other stuff that's kind of proving to be very sticky, um, but but there's definitely been an increase in um, sympathy for people without a job and um, much more support for the government stepping in and providing that safety net. So there's a message of hope, I guess. Rebecca, did you have something to say earlier? I saw you raising your oh, hand. Oh, yeah, it was just, it was um, in response to the kind of uh, securitous kind of conversation that was around um Yoni's suggestion about the language we're using to dismantle or the language that we where is informed by these notions of the individual um and then Loriana I did want to kind of just respond to the assumption that you know that we're all children of the enlightenment um as particularly on this on this land um European colonial thought is uh very foreign um, even as, you know, a colonial subject, um, not a dispossessed um, or a First Nations Indigenous. But it's, it, it just made me think about the urgency around needing to shift from that, even if um, that there is a pre-existing and much more ancient and much, you know, more um, resilient um, definition or relationship to country and as humans that bring together a kind of more than human world and it strikes me that just in response to what Yoni was saying that it's the kind of thinking we really need to shift um, if we're talking about a UBI if that's the conversation if that's where we want to be then we really do need some radical redefinitions of the human um, and so I guess just to you know remark that that's the I, I, I want to have that debate you know I want to you know I don't care if we throw out the individual and the enlightenment and the individual rights. I'm ready to throw those out, actually. Yeah. Don't throw the water out with the baby, I think <laughs> is what it's in it. No, there's yeah. a drought and uh, you <laughs> need that water. <laughs> but I think, you know, what you're talking about is so intense. I mean, this is this, it's critical thinking and m maybe mixing in with, you know, Indigenous epistemologies, which we need to marry. And, you know, I, I've got this silly term I talk about at the moment, critical dreaming, which is where art comes into it too because it's really about imagination right and it's about how you reimagine and understand your relationship through time with other beings that are around and we know that we can listen to that here that's that is something powerful that we have in this in this amazing land that we happen to be very lucky to be living on as well as across the globe you know this is not something that we experience but it's it's closer to us to hear because dispossession is much um it was it was a few hundred years ago as opposed to a few thousand years ago in you know the land of europe and these other kind of places but maybe it is about opening up to those epistemologies that are here that are still practiced and then using that as an opportunity to you know amplify and go hey how about these as options you know these are still very real and still very practiced and and i think well, that's that's the work we have to do you know Hopefully someone can pay for that at some stage, you know, with the UBI, but we have to do that work and it's all, it's all interconnected. 
Sorry, I'm supposed to be hosting, not having any opinion. But maybe we can, you know, think about um, maybe we should rob some banks, you know, like in terms of um, strategies, just going back to what Nick and Thomas were, you know, like the, the very practical question that is posed that Thomas was kind of ag agitating us to think about, you know, how, how do you reach the quiet Australians? How we, you know, Does that, radical, point, we need some Matt, radical ideas to address that. I think. Totally, and I want to. They, you also mentioned slavery and um, and and gay marriage, and 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 what is it in the will of people that makes people want to go for these things? Is the will there at the moment? Of course, it's not because they don't know about it, but it is in them. Like nobody actually truly intrinsically wants slavery, but they will go for it if it fulfills whatever system they're in. Like if it if it feeds them and they don't have to do anything about it. This kind of but that also kind of comes back to Lauriana's point around discourse and around like the stories that we're mm. told about ourselves and the stories that we're told about each other and you know of course people will go for slavery if they're told that that's over and over and over again that that's what's happening I suppose totally the seriality yeah. which is why there needs to be a cooking show by David as part of it too because it's not <laughs> part of that current seriality um Nithya wants to come in can we open all of them uh, yes I just <laughs> Sorry, Nithya, go. That's okay. Uh, I just wanted to say something about that um, quiet Australians comment and this idea of bringing in a bipartisan, a bipartisan support. Um, I think earlier um, when um, Nick and Thomas, you were speaking about um, increasing tax and decreasing the welfare state or the, the bureaucracy around the welfare state, um, which, you know, in a, in a cold um uh, current government ways. Oh, that's less public government jobs, and that's um, more tax. And you know, it's it's a pretty hard sell. And so, I guess I am interested in what does it look like? What is the most bipartisan financing system that we can see here for a model like this? Um, obviously, things like subsidies to to um, industries like fossil fuels that are um, becoming slowly redundant um, are one of the ways that we should be exploring. But what is a bipartisan way to push this that isn't isn't um, just reliant on the the quality, the values that everybody on this call basically shares, but also brings in people. And just as a like a side note to that, I want to note that in in America, um, you know, even lower middle income people are against um, universal public health care. And that is just shows you how deeply the rhetoric can go in thinking that, you know, if somebody else gets it, that means there's some sort of something I'm not getting or something that, that's free that I'm, and, and I don't think that um, Australia is as far away from that type of mentality as it should be. Um, so yes, just throwing that. I leave that as a comment, Nithya, because we're actually totally running out of time and this has been a fantastic conversation. I just wanted to ask any, David, um, do you want to say anything else? Because we haven't heard from you for a little bit maybe it's the final word as the minister for the arts what do we need to what do we need to do uh actually i think that look i i was really um i've just been thinking so much about yoni's um question and I, I found it really fascinating because i can't really answer that question but in, sorry philosophers that, will do that to you they do that to you. The, 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 um, I can't answer that question, you know, in any other ways that as an artist. And so I, I just want to say, you know, that the kind of the, the embedding of Christianity in the, in the discourse is, is so profound and, you know, it gets conflated with, um, you know, the, the, the overriding ideological discourse of neoliberalism. I'm really paraphrasing there. Um, but it made me think of what, do, what, what, to, what have I drawn uh, my practice from and and my on my mum's side um she's uh she, she's she's calabrian um and so my um my i'm drawn to you know generations before her just a couple of generations before her where there was a, a really strong paganism in that kind of peasant culture that's really came with my grandparents when they came here and then when i was in my late teens i left um melbourne for from you know regularly from the age of, of 15 until I was 21. And I traveled all around Australia. And 
one of the things that is completely inscribed in my practice as an artist is the experience of landscape. And through that, I basically, you know, went and learned from, you know, various First Nations people about what land meant to culture. And so I've got these conflations of, you know, this sort of personal background, this place in, um, uh, you know, this, this place that I live in, but also I have always had an incredible attraction to Asia. So I've always studied, you know, with Japanese and Korean uh, artists and practitioners. And I'm just trying to find the line of, um, you know, Christianity in there. And it just keeps bumping this way and that way and this way and that way. And I, I, I haven't answered the question, but I, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to have let, allow, allow me to kind of speak my thoughts out loud. So thank you. That's fabulous. Uh, thank you from the Minister for Artists about that very, um, you know, uh, an approach of multiplicity to an extraordinarily, you know, complicated uh, set of relationships that we have over time. And um, before we're going to we're going to go now, um, but and we're going to hear from the future Minister for Artists who I only met a couple of days ago, actually quite an amazing uh, performance poet from Sydney called Mel Ray, and um, she's going to tell us the truth in a moment. Um, and 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 before we go there, we're going to go to another little sting, a little video that's been put together by the fabulous Sarah Jane Woolahan. Um, thank you for the conversation, everyone. It's yes, been thank really you. good. Thanks for bearing with us. <laughs> Clock it on. Clock it on. <laughs> All right, we're going to close the camera now. Stop, 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 <laughs> On a dark and cloudy Redfern pavement beneath Sydney's cement sky, a slouch drunk sways delirious, sidewalk threatening to crack skull open like a shivering window at the mercy of flying debris. A voice in us begs, stop, help him. Instead, we shuffle past in radio silence. Try to transmit hope with a sorry side glance. Out skies, ash falls. A solemn salute to our polluting ignorance. Winds spread flames like disease carried on wings of volcanic spray. We are reminded we are wafer weak. Crushable, deaths are mounting, mounted on the shoulders of our most vulnerable. In promise, they will drown silently. Not a wave's chance they will float, nor justice here beneath the bubbling tar. An incessant city clamoring like zombies ravenous for the last living corpse. Here, under metropolitan railway tracks like monumental razor blades at the throat of indigenous land rights, we gather the artists and their allies huddled like starving wolves escaping harsh winter storms. In a world that hangs constitutional laws as political ropes around our necks. In a society that glorifies toxic predators in the name of sport and white privilege. We assemble a battlefield of emotion, surrendering all at once to say, I have no more fight today. I just want to be held and here. On the outskirts of the mainstream, we are dreaming awake. We who refuse to turn dreams to wrenches, who will not surrender our humanity to the mechanical gluttony of capitalism. 
We are gathered to witness the holy sanctuary of art. Sweat stains, bleary eyes, shards of guilt trapped in throat and chest, suffocated by endless lies, endlessly searching for the entity birthing between my breasts. I feel her breath breathing heavily into my next decision. Decisions, decisions, when you've lost all vision of who you thought you'd be. My skin is the only thing holding me together. In the darkness, a voice that echoes on forever. This is the moment. The one that makes you or breaks you, lifts you up, recreates you. This is the reckoning, the rise. This is the moment. Make way for something new. Let it change you, charge you. Fuck sorrow. Choose substance. Choose character. Fuck your childhood. Your mother was an amateur. Your fears. They're bullshit, my friend. False evidence appearing real. Believing lies has been your trend. Soaking in suffering your means to an end. The voice, it summons. Stand up. Place your feet on the floor. Wash your mouth. Open the door. One step at a time. Back away from the shelf. Let's time to reinvent yourself. Get in that buddy, have a hop, start to the shop, take it, stop and rock your way up to the top. Get your head down, ass up, back straight. Keep your mind on the top. Head down, ass up, back straight. Tighten your back to the top. Oh, it's pretty much dreaming. Yes. 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 Oh, wow. Do you want to come over here and we'll, we'll just wrap up and say um, good night, Australia and the world. <laughs> but also, um, there's going to be one more video playing after this. It's called Book of Dream. And it's an amazing little uh, piece that was put together by Devika, uh, Billy Moria, Amy Hanley in conjunction with uh, the world production artists. Um, but over to you too. Well, I think that we've heard so many different perspectives today and we've seen some amazing work and we've created this strange TV studio <laughs> in the Mechanics <laughs> Institute in Brunswick and we've practiced live streaming. Um, it's been really collaborative and really fun. Absolutely, and I just want to say thank you to the both of you because I think as an artist in the real world, you often feel alienated from these types of conversations and I'm just so grateful to be in this space and realize that we're all in it together and there are people out there fighting the good fight and it gives me so much hope. Thank you guys. Yeah, it's much better when we do it in the unreal world. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> we can make the reality happen right yeah. now. You know, as Mark said, reality is what we make together and it's fucking true to yeah. this day. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Your art ah, thank you. And your power. Over and out. Ciao. <laughs> on your life, for instance, that you would call culture? Well, uh, this weekend I was on the beach. Yes. And on the beach these days are uh, transistor radios. Yes. Blaring out rock and roll. Yes. All over. Yes. And you didn't enjoy it? 
Not particularly. I adjusted to it. How? By saying that... Well, I... I thought of the sun and the sea as a lesser evil. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know how I did, adjusted to that problem of the radio in the environment. Very much as the uh, primitive people adjusted to the animals which frightened them and which probably, as you say, were intrusions. They made, drew pictures of them hmm? on their caves. And so I simply made a piece using radios. Now, whenever I hear radios, even a single one, not just 12 at a time, as you must have heard on the beach, at least, I think, well, they're just playing my piece. <laughs> <laughs> That might help me next weekend. Yeah, and I listen to it with pleasure. Uh, by, by pleasure, I mean uh, I notice what happens. I can attend to it rather than, uh, as you say, surrender. I can rather pay attention and become interested in the... Um, well, what it, what it actually is that you're interested in is what superimposes what. What happens at the same time, together with what happens before and what happens after. Yes, but I can't think unless thought is something of the past. Uh, the other night I met some friends in a place which I was very nostalgic about. I used to go there and talk a lot. No one could hear each other. Because of this? Because of this. You know, well, oh. this, this brings up the remark of Satie's that uh, what we need is a music which will um, not interrupt the noises of the environment. Mm -hmm. In other words, we might then need thoughts uh, which would not uh, impose upon the transistorized <laughs> radios. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is that this is a coin which has two sides. And that the, um, say you think of your thoughts as the reality, or your conversation at least, that you wish to have as a reality, and the environment is an in intrusion, then that sati remark just takes that coin, turns it over, and says the reality is the environment. What you want to do in it is an intrusion. And finally, the work of an artist, for instance, is it not an, an incisive intrusion? Hmm? Because for heaven's sake, it didn't exist until the artist does it. Hmm? Yes, I never heard anybody really boo a transistor radio. <laughs> I think, well, you have just now, in a sense, and I, uh, I have done it formerly when I would go into any friend's home um, out of deference, you know, to my tastes. Uh, seeing me coming, they simply turned off all the, um, any radio that was or even a disc that happened to be playing at the time. Now they no longer do it. They know that I think that I composed all those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a problem for me. I feel that I'm quite at odds with it. Well, maybe I like, maybe actually I really like things to, um, but for example, if I'm standing in front of a jet and I hear the blaring sound, I don't feel annoyed because I know it's going to take me someplace. Yeah. Or that it's bringing some friend. The noise is utilitarian. <laughs> <coughs> and it almost dramatizes the flight. You know. Yeah. But, 
But that then is not an intrusion, really. That's a, that's a sound which, because of other things you're doing, you must uh, carry along, as it were, with you, with your experience at any rate. What would you say to giving a concert of your works in an architectural situation where something else that was going on was um, at least partly audible at the same time. Let's imagine, just to make the conversation consistent, that a um, um, concert is in a room and that one door from that room is open and in the room upon which it opens, um, radio music is audible. Now, must that door be closed or may it be left open? I would like the door to be left open, but without the radio. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I want to leave the door open, but of course, Well, all we have to do to know that that in that room, if the door is open, all we have to do to know that there is something in that room that that if we are exercising our um, choices, we will know that in that room is something we don't desire if if we are living with our desires or our choices. And the only, only thing that, the simplest thing you can do to find out that that's the case is simply to pick up a newspaper because the things that are happening are not things that you would have chosen in your right mind to have happen in the world, in that room. Now, years ago, the radio was blaring. I think that there was just uh, as many intrusions as there are today, but I didn't hear them. Today I hear them. So there must be something there that seems to be competing with me. Or let's put it this way, that my old role ha has been uh, weakened psychologically. Well, what was your role? The old-fashioned law of the artist, deep in thought. Well, this is certainly changing, I think. And, um... Since, since it's perfectly clear that you're a magnificent artist in that role of being deep in thought, hmm? What I would like to see is how magnificent you are intruded upon. What do you think of that idea? Do you recall, I, isn't this true that once when we had one of those conversations we so, um, uh, I'm sure each of us so remembers walking through the streets of Lower East Side and the village and whatnot until late hours at night. Um, I think I expressed once the idea that that you had discovered a, a world, a musical world, because it was your music, really, that opened up uh, everything, your piece, the, uh, uh, what was it called, the one for, I think the first one was for piano. Projection. Projection, yes. yes. and. And you wrote it uh, down at Monroe Street, and David Tudor and I were in the other room. And you left us, and you wrote this piece on graph, giving us this um, freedom of playing in those three ranges, high, middle, and low. And um, then we went in and played the piece, and it was then that the, the musical world changed. Now, not just the musical world 
outside of you, but the musical world inside of you, hmm? in this role that you speak of, deep in thought. Nevertheless, the thing I think I said to you once on that walk through the night is now that you have opened up this world, let us see all the things that are in it. Now, among the things that are in that world is this situation of granted someone deep in thought, his being intruded 